Well, hello and welcome to the Old Time Movie Radio Show, where we enjoy compilations of episodes of your favorite old time radio shows based on your favorite movie characters and actors. Now, tonight we're looking at characters from author Dashiell Hammett's books that were turned into films and then made their way to the radio. First up, we've got The Adventures of the Thin Man. This show ran from 1941 to 1950. And the show was modeled after the film series based on the 1934 Dashiell Hammett novel. Then also tonight, we've got The Adventures of Sam Spade. Now, the character of Sam Spade comes from the Maltese Falcon, but I have to admit, this show is not modeled after the book or the movie, but it was a wildly successful radio show. It ran from 1946 until 1951. Howard Duff plays Sam Spade, and we've also got a couple episodes with movie actor Stephen Dunn as Spade, and Loreen Tuttle played Effie throughout the whole show. Now, of course, in The Adventures of the Thin Man, Les Damon, Les Tremaine, and David Gothard all played the character of Nick Charles, and Claudia Morgan played the role of Nora Charles throughout the whole show. Oh, also forgot Joseph Curtin, who took over the role in 1950. So we've got a nice little mix and match of the shows, the characters, the actors, and we're sure to be in for an enjoyable evening. Now, just before we get into the show, just want to remind you of, of a couple ways you can help support the channel, help keep these great shows coming. First off, we've got the Johnny Dollar Club. Starting at just a dollar a month, you can help support the channel. We've got three ways to join. Check out the links in the description below. We've got coffee.com, buymeacoffee.com, and Patreon. And a lot of you have asked about using PayPal. So the first link for coffee.com is a great option for you. Another way you can help support the channel and get some fun stuff is to check out our hearth and home shop on Etsy. We've got the yours truly Johnny Dollar collection. And I've got some fun Christmas items, including some old time radio themed gift wrap paper. But now without any further ado, let's get on with our program. It's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy Dashiell Hammett on the radio with the adventures of the Thin Man and the adventures of Sam Spade. <laughs> Post Coasties, or Host Posties, or that is Rose Coasties, I mean Toast Posties, presents, or present... Hey, get that name right, my confused friend. It's Post Toasties. Post Toasties. Chris, delicious Post Toasties present The Adventures of the Thin Man, starring Claudia Morgan and Les Damon. A basic seven food with whole grain nourishment, Post Toasties. find our old friend, Sheriff Ebenezer Williams, ringing the doorbell of Nick and Nora Charles' apartment. Nicky, darling, I didn't expect... Oh, Ev Williams. Howdy, Nori. Ev, darling, come in. Well? Where's Essie? Oh, she's coming on a later train. Don't let Essie hear you call me darling. <laughs> Everybody's a darling tonight, Ev. This is going to be the most wonderful anniversary Nicky and I ever had. If he remembers about it, the big goon. Well, did he forget? He didn't mention a word about it all day. Oh, well, I reckon he's trying to tease you. You look lovely, Ev. Yeah, I got on my best bib and tucker. I save these clothes for funerals and weddings. You look mighty spruce yourself, Nori. Do you really think so, Ev? I uh, got this evening gown especially for tonight. Yeah. Uh, do you like it? You seem to fill it out fine. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that must be Nicky now. Eb, mm. don't you remind him that this is our anniversary. I want to see if he forgot. What'll you do if he has? Well, I can't make up my mind. Shall I blow his brains out or slit his throat? Oh, slit his throat. Because if you try to blow his brains out, you might miss the target. It being so small, you know. Nicky, darling. Hello, baby. Mm. <laughs> <sighs> um... Didn't um, you forget something, dear? No, darling. Here's the half pound of butter you asked me to bring home. Oh. When I promised the grocer I'd marry his daughter, he let me have it. Oh, hello, Ev. Howdy, Nick. Oh, awfully nice to see you again. What brought you to town? Steam cars. Oh, <laughs> I thought there was something up. Well, there is. What? Oh, I come in to see a fellow's throat slit. Oh, whose? Friend of mine. Oh. Well, Nora and I haven't seen an interesting throat slitting in a long time. Can we come along? Yes, be glad to have you. Say, Nora... What are you all dressed up for? And Ev, you're all dolled up too. Why? For the funeral of the fellow that's going to get his throat slit. Oh, <laughs> well, I guess I better change. I'll see you in a minute. Oh, oh, Ev, he completely forgot. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> see if that package really has got butter into it. Oh, I didn't think of that. Oh, Ev, huh? it is butter. 
Well, what you crying for? Butter has it pines. Oh, that big groom. You'll see if I'll ever marry him again. Oh, why do I love a husband I hate so much? Oh, just a minute. Oh, uh, Mrs. Charles? Yes. I'm Mr. Squiller of Squiller Incorporated. Oh. Flowers for the dead, dying, and married. <laughs> Where shall I put this? Oh, the, the flowers. Oh, over there. <laughs> Very well. Uh, uh, do you have a cold? No, I'm allergic to blossoms. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, Miss Charles. Yes. May I extend my deepest and heartfelt condolences on this uh, 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 occasion? Oh, well, well, thank you. I, what did you say? I saw you crying when I came in. Perhaps he's happier in another world. Mm -hmm. Who can tell? My deepest sympathies, madam. My heart bleeds for you. You'll get my bill in the morning. Uh, oh. Goodbye. Allergy in a country churchyard. Look at that bunch of poses he's in. Mm. Wonder if I'm celebrating an anniversary or winning a horse race. Let's see what the ribbon says. <gasps> oh, well, Darling, how do you like the flowers? Aren't they lovely? Beautiful, dear. I'm just mad about the inscription. Rest in peace. Huh? So appropriate for an anniversary. What are you talking about? That their <laughs> ribbon, Nick. Couldn't they get you one that said success? Yeah, let me see. <laughs> Lilies. This is a funeral bower. Where are the jewels? What jewels, dear? I bought a necklace and told him to send it with the flowers. You expect me to believe that? But I did. You forgot our anniversary entirely. Oh, darling, don't you see? I did send you flowers. They were delivered here by mistake. But I bought a gift for you, too. You're just making that up. You don't love me anymore. But I do love you. <laughs> you hear that, Abby? He's shouting at me now. No. I'm going back to the flower shop and find out what happened. You mean you're running out to buy me something? Oh, I know all your little tricks. All right, all right. You can come along. And you can come, too, Eb, as a witness. Maybe that funeral wreath isn't so inappropriate for our wrecked marriage. Rest in peace. Oh, Eb. Oh, please, don't scream at me so. I, I can't bear it, Mr. Charles. It drives me mad. You soon died. Oh, look, Mr. Squiller, all I want to know is who got the necklace I left with you. If he left any necklace. Which I'm beginning to doubt. <laughs> Don't confuse me so, please. I'm suffering acutely from allergies. I'm sneezing my brains out. I, I hardly know what I'm doing anymore. All right, look, I'll make it simple. I got a funeral wreath. Now, you must have delivered my flowers and the jewelry to somebody else. Do you suppose that's what I did? Yes, I do. Probably you sent it to the person who was supposed to get the funeral wreath. Why, of course, I remember now. How perfectly idiotic of me. Yes, well, where did you send my jewels and the flowers? <laughs> Let me see. Now, oh, here, here's the card. Mrs. Gwen Gray Gilroy, 1408 East 86th Street. Gwen Gray Gilroy? Nikki, hmm? isn't she that showgirl who threatened to commit suicide when you married me? Which one do you mean, dear? <laughs> the one you nicknamed Strikeout. Because she had so many curves. <laughs> she called you Sugar Man. Oh, I'm sure it's not the same person. She married a millionaire named Gilroy. I read it in the papers. Nick, have you been sending her flowers and jewelry? Oh, look, what am I getting into here? No, this is just a simple mix-up. Probably due to Mr. Squiller's allergy. Uh, I'm so sorry all this happened. My nose is just driving me crazy. Uh, why don't you quit the flower business if you're allergic to flowers? Uh, well, how can I quit when I'm losing money? It's a vicious circle, starting from my nose and ending with my bank account. Believe me, when I think of my troubles, I, I could weep. Oh, come, Nicky. We're going to Mrs. Gilroy's. And if what I suspect is true, you're going to be dead before morning. Oh, will he really, Mrs. Charles? Yeah, you can depend upon it, Mr. Squiller. In that case, remember where to buy your flowers for the funeral, Mrs. Charles. Just a moment. Why, Sugar Man. Oh, strike out. So, it is her. Sugar Man, you found out about poor Virgil dying and you came back. Uh, no, not exactly strike out. Uh, this is my wife, Nora. Oh, how do you do? Uh, not as well as you seem to be doing. And this is my friend, Sheriff Ebenezer Williams. How do you strike out? Uh, does that coffin contain the remains of your late spouse? Yes. <laughs> now, look, Gwen. There's been a kind of mix-up. 
Did Mr. Squiller deliver some flowers to you? Yes, Nicky. They're at the head of the casket. Why? Was there a package with them? Well, I don't know. I wasn't here when they arrived. Let's take a look, Nick. Maybe it's with the flowers. Yes, come on. How did he work out as a husband, Nora? Uh, not uh, badly. Don't seem to be here, Nick. I'll open the casket, Ed. Maybe that idiotic florist put it in there. Uh, maybe he was playing treasure hunter. Uh, uh. Say, look. The casket's empty. Uh, Godfrey, nobody home. What are you talking about? Like out your husband's body isn't here. The casket's empty. Virgil gone? Say, that jerk can't do this to me. Mm, too bad Nick didn't send that package by post. Toasties, Ted. Huh? Whenever you say post, follow up quick with toasties. Post toasties. You know... Delicious, crisper cornflakes? Oh, yeah, but I'm talking about a package. Large or small. You know, Ted, Post Toasties come in different size packages. Well, sure they do. And my friend, when you always buy the largest package instead of the smallest size, you save up to 17 cents on every dollar spent for Post Toasties. Now, that's something you can count on, a basic saving. Hey, did you say basic seven? Mm Mm-mm, but you know, Post Toasties are a basic seven food, one type of food our government urges us to eat for wartime strength and fitness. Mm Mm-hmm, Post Toasties are a swell source of quick energy with whole grain nourishment, including iron, niacin, vitamin B1. Well, what do you know? I've been eating Post Toasties just because they taste so good. Will you keep right on, my friend. Enjoy that good ripe corn flavor, that toasty crispness, that valuable whole grain nourishment. Mm Mm-hmm. Enjoy Post Toasties. A delicious, nourishing, crisper, basic seven food, Post Toasties. Tonight's adventure of the Thin Man. Mrs. Gwen Gray Gilroy, known to Nick and Nora as Strikeout, has just found that her husband's body is not in the coffin. We heard her say, Virgil gone? Say, that jerk can't do this to me. Maybe he stole the necklace and beat it. He couldn't. He was dead. Are you sure of that, Gwen? Sure, certainly. I saw him croak with my own eyes. Well, somebody stole that necklace. Somebody stole my husband's body. Certain there's a crook around here, by Godfrey. Well, come on, Eb. We're going to turn this place inside out. I'm sure it's... Say, here's the body. Where? Behind the sofa. Uh, you must have misplaced it, Strikeout. <laughs> well, how did it get there? I reckon he was just hiding to scare us. Say, Strikeout, is that a picture of the deceased? Yes. And he didn't die of disease. Heart attack, the doctor said. Looky, Nick. That there ain't a picture of the corpse. Let me see. Oh. Gwen, is that Virgil? No, it... Somebody else. Where'd you get him, Gwen? I don't know. Oh, this is awful. Hey, wait a minute. I found something here. What is it, Nick? Another cadaver? No. It's a bill from the luxury deluxe hotel in this fellow's pocket. A dollar and twenty-five cents for a week's board. Reasonable. Yes. This hotel's down in the Bowery. Sugar man. Won't you find poor Virgil's body for me? The funeral's all arranged and I have a lovely black dress already. Never mind about that body, Nick. You'd better find that necklace, if there was one stolen. Uh, Nick, do you think the same crook that stole the body stole the necklace? You've got something there, Ed. We're going to the luxury deluxe hotel right now. Oh, this is awful. This is terrible. No, 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 no. Don't take it too hard, strike out. Your husband had to go sometime. That's not why I'm crying. Suppose Virgil is alive. I won't collect a penny. Oh, he's just got to be dead. <laughs> Good evening, fans. Welcome to the Luxury Deluxe Hotel. No opium smoking and no murder allowed. Oh, a respectable joint. I thought we was coming to one of these here low dives. Awful disappointing. Well, fans... Would you like a room with a window or just a room? Uh, not exactly. You see... Here, my friend. Where'd you get my watch? Oh, that's just to show how honest we are. Don't you recognize me, Nicky? Oh, Dippy Danny, the pickpocket. <laughs> what are you doing here? Well, I decided to go straight for the duration. 
My contribution to the war effort. <laughs> Danny, this is my wife, Nora. Oh, how do you do? Huh. Are you a very experienced pickpocket, Mr. Dippy? Nora, I've had my hands in some of the most well-greased pockets in this country. Uh, here's your change, please. Oh. oh, thank you. And this is my old friend, Ed Williams. Howdy, Dippy. Hello, son. Here's your wallet. Miss Dippy looks... So... Good, how do you do it? I'll show you later if you want to know. Uh, hey... Hey, you got in that sheet over your shoulder, son. All right, Eb. Put him down there and uncover him. Okie, okay, baby, dokie. Easy does it. Ah. You recognize him, Danny? Kind of stiff, huh? Yeah, I know him. Who is he? Fellow named Joe Jones. Died here three days ago. Oh, we found him in a swanky apartment uptown. How'd he get there? Well, it's kind of a queer story. A dame come in and wanted the dead body. What? Yeah. She wanted to rent one. I told her I had one, so I rented them to her for two bucks. Is, is renting bodies part of your regular line of business here? No, but I don't mind picking up a little spare change now and then. A fellow needs it, you know, what with taxes. Yeah, sure. Well, what else do you know about this woman? Well, she rented a room here. It's right down the hall. Uh, you want to see it? Yes, I certainly do. Uh, what's her name? Mrs. John Smith, she says. Uh, you think she was lying, Nick? What does she look like? I couldn't see. She was wearing a black veil. Uh, here's the room. Oh, it looks like an ideal honeymoon suite for a couple of zombies. Oh, look, Nick. Well, say, what do you know? That's the body of Strikeout's husband. Yes, and he's been struck out, all right. But good. Here, look at the eyes, Ed. He's been poisoned. Murdered by Godfrey. I knew it. Can't we ever have an anniversary without a murder? Nora, you and Ev go home. There's some checking up I want to do. I'll be there in an hour. All right, Nick. I'll be glad to get out of this terrible place. Wait a minute. Did you say he was poisoned, Nick? Yes, Danny. Why? He should have known better. It's against the rules of the hotel. <laughs> find out who stole that necklace is by solving this murder. I'd like to have a nice cozy talk with Strikeout. Oh, no, you don't. Not on my wedding anniversary. But, uh... Well, Ed, yeah. you think you can find out what I want to know from Strikeout? Sure thing. You know how I handle women, Nick. <laughs> All right, Ed. You get her to tell you everything she can about Bart and Bellows. Yeah? She's been seen around with him. Find out if she's got a black veil and... Find out just what happened when her husband died. All right, I'll go right now. You can be careful, Ed. Strikeout can be dangerous when she's cornered. I'll keep her away from corners then. See you later, Nick. <laughs> Bye. Who are you calling, Nick? Barton Bellows, baby. Oh. Hello, Mr. Bellows' residence. Oh, uh, are you Mr. Bellows' maid? Yeah. Are you happy working for Mr. Bellows? Well, my name's Nick Charles. Uh, maybe I can offer you a better job. Do you like it there? Well, Mr. Bellows ain't married, so we don't have a wife who'll let me wear a fur coat like in the last job I had. Oh, but... Well, my wife would let you wear hers. Can I speak to your wife? Why, sure. No. Hmm? Get her to quit her job right now. Not only is it necessary, but we can also get a maid. Oh, Hello? Your husband says I can wear your fur coat if I work for you. Well, of course. What kind of a coat have you got? Persian lamb. Oh, Persian lamb. I can get lots of jobs with a Persian lamb coat. Oh, but I, I also have a mink coat. Oh, mink? Uh -huh. That's more like it. How much will you pay? Well, how much do you get? Thirty dollars a week. I'll give you forty. Two nights off a week, and can I use the telephone when I want? Yes. Also, can I have my boyfriend in Saturday night? Yes, of course. That's the kind of a job I want. Then you must quit right now and come over here. The address is 409 Park Drive. Okay, I'll be there right away. Uh, I, uh, I hope you don't think it's odd, my stealing you from Mr. Bellows over the phone this way. Oh, no. That's how he got me. It's wonderful being a maid these days, Mrs. Charles. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, you've got a maid. So now what? So now, Nora, you're going to find out a few things about Barton Bellows for me. You are going to be a Swedish maid applying for a job. Oh, you mean a vain girl who scrubs clean like anything by Jumpen Himmelis? Oh. Good evening. Are you Mr. Bellows? Yes. 
A. Bain, expert Swedish maid, cook, housekeeper, nurse, a laundress, and dishwasher. A. Have used to quit a job and told my madam to go to... <clears throat> um, maybe you have a job for me? Do I have a job for you? Come right in. You were sent from heaven. No. A. Come from Brooklyn. I mean, my maid just quit. I need someone to take care of my house. I'll pay you anything you want. Oh. Is that picture of your wife? Well, no, not exactly. This beautiful woman, she writes, Sue Barton, the one and only in my life, all my love, again. <laughs> if she's not your wife, why does she love you? Well, she's a kind of a friend of mine. I'm not married. Oh, not married? I am not married, do you? Well, I hope you'll like this job. I'll do anything you want to make you happy. Will you marry me? Well, uh, no. I but... think I go home. Uh, no, no, please. I, uh, I mean, I'll be nice to you. That won't be hard. You're uh, very pretty. You think so? Yeah. Oh, uh, I think maybe I stay. Ah, look at this drawer. So messy. Full of old letters. Uh, what are you doing there? I must see if you'll pay your bill. I don't work for a man who does not pay his bill. Ah, here is interesting letter. Dearest Barton, I don't think poor Virgil can live very much longer. The old goat is due to kick the bucket soon, and they can get yeah, married. Yeah, give me that. It is from that Gwen. So you want to marry her? Well, that's none of your business. Where a work, everything is my business. Aha, you have a little bottle here, a little bottle of pills. I wonder what they are. Here, don't open that. Now take your hands off me or I smack your face. Yes. Here is your bottle of pills. I don't think they would be so good for me anyway. I, I think you'd better leave. I'm afraid I can't use leave. them. Leave? You'd best buy him any hay leave. They will not work such a filthy place. Look at these dishes. Get out of here. You insult me. Hey, Critch. Look at this bar. Filthy. Ye are a beast. But, Abby, are you sure he was poisoned? Yeah, yeah. Now, you better tell me all you know about it, strike out. This is murder. You can go to jail for that, by Godfrey. Have you told the police yet? No. Don't tell them, Abby. I'm sure they'll suspect me. You will be a nice little boy and not mention a word about it. Well, it ain't easy to keep a thing like this secret. I know, but won't you do this to poor little me? If you kept a thing like... Ain't you misplaced your arm, Striker? Oh, don't misunderstand, Debbie. I'm just holding you because I'm frightened. No. You're just like my daddy. You know what he used to do when I was frightened? Don't knock my derby off. What? He used to hold me in his arms like this and then kiss me like this. Your daddy done that? Mm hmm Sweet papa. You're sweet too, Abby. You won't call the police, will you, daddy? Uh, well, I reckon I'll think about it. Uh, where's your clothes closet, strike out? There. Why? Uh, I just want to take a look. You wear this black veil very much? What do you want with that veil? Hello, darling. I... Oh, I see you have company. Barton, I didn't hear you come in. Ed, this is Barton Bellow. Howdy, Barton. Hello. When I've got to talk to you. And i got to see you, too. They found Virgil's body. I'll open it. Oh, hello, Ed. Why, Nori and Nick. Come in, Jim. Ed, uh, your lipstick smeared. <laughs> I reckon I got that comfort in strike out here. Sugar man, you won't let him call the police, will you? Just wait a day until I see my lawyer. Strike out, is that man Barton Bellows? That's him. The Swedish maid. Say, what is this all about? You'll find out in a minute. Mr. Bellows, you better sit down. Sugar man, what are you going to do? Strike out, who was here on the night that your husband got killed? Just Barton and me and Virgil. Why? When did he die? About nine o'clock. We had brandy in this very room. And Virgil stood up and collapsed. Barton. What did you do with the body? Barton put a sheet over him. I was hysterical, so Barton gave me a sedative and I went to bed. I see. Ed, huh. did you find anything here? Yeah, this black veil, Nick. 
Just like the time the Chappelle Dipper, see. Nicky, sugar man, what's the veil got to do with all this? Gwen, the person who murdered your husband tried a very slick trick. The killer obtained the body of a man who died naturally and put it under that sheet to deceive the examining doctor. Your husband's body was hidden in the luxury deluxe hotel in the Bowery. It was hidden there by a woman who wore a black veil, Gwen. The killer had only one problem. Again, the bodies had to be exchanged again. The poison man's body would have been buried and nobody would even know your husband was murdered, Gwen. Isn't he brilliant? Only one thing went wrong with this almost perfect murder, Gwen. The killer planned to change the bodies tonight. But after the corpse of the Bowery derelict was removed from the coffin, there was an interruption. Flowers arrived. The flowers that were sent here by mistake. So the killer quickly hid the corpse behind the sofa. Well, how do you know that? I checked with Mr. Squiller, the florist. He heard something being moved about just before he came in. Now, whoever moved that corpse is the killer. Now, Gwen, the elevator boy said you left word when you went out to let Mr. Squiller in with the building's pass key. That sounds like a good alibi, but can you prove you were out of the house at that time, Gwen? You're not going to get away with this. Grab her, Nick. She's going for that drawer. My God, don't get try it. Up. God, my God, please. Stand back, all of you. First one who makes a move to touch you is going to get killed. I'm getting out of here. I... All right. Switch your hands off the light. Nick, you're going to get away. You let go. Don't. Don't. Oh. Here, light a match. Okay. Nora, turn on that switch. That one over there. All right. Here, take this gun and cover bellows. Do the kill if he tries anything. Are you crazy? She was trapped and she committed suicide. The gun's still in her hand. She shot herself. Nicky, is she dead? No, baby. It's just a flesh wound. She'll be okay. Phone the police and tell them to send an ambulance. All right. Fellows, they're under arrest for murder. You don't know what you're talking about. Her attempt to kill herself proves she's guilty. You see Gwen's wristwatch? The crystal doesn't get crushed when you try to commit suicide. It got crushed when you grabbed her arm in the dark and twisted it and turned the gun on her. You murdered her husband... Nora got one of the poison pills you used when she went to your apartment. You'll never be able to prove this. I got proof already, pal. For instance, you're the only one that would be familiar enough with this room to know where the light switch is. And what's more, you left fingerprints all over that room at the Hotel Luxury Deluxe. When you come down there in the dress and clothes that you stole from Gwen. Yes, what else have I done? You stole your necklace, Nick. Yeah, it is. Where'd you get that? Out of your pocket. Why, oh, yeah, but I didn't know you were a pickpocket. Uh, I got Danny the Dipper to show me how to do it. <laughs> Well, that about clinches it, Bellows. That proves you were here when the flowers arrived. You murdered Virgil Gilroy because you wanted to marry Strikeout after she inherited his dough. And stop shivering, Bellows. You'll be warmed up soon enough. Will you pull the covers up, darling? It gets chilly. Okay. Man, that better? Mm-hmm. What made Barton Bellows steal the necklace? Well, he got cold feet when he was interrupted by Squiller. He figured it would come in handy if he had to clear out in a hurry and needed money for it. Hmm. Well, why'd Strikeout pull that gun? Well, she thought she was being framed and she lost her head. Hey, does that clear up everything? Mm-hmm. Darling, it was a lovely anniversary. Even if we did have to celebrate rather late. Uh-huh. You should have got a suit there? No. Let's stay up and remember old times. That's what people should do on anniversary. Oh, but no, I want to sleep. You didn't feel that way in our wedding night. No. Hmm. You're getting old, Nicky. Who's getting old? <laughs> I can stay awake forever if I want to. Me getting old? <laughs> it's ridiculous. I can stay up all night for a week if I want to. I just... The water now. You're fibbing. You can't. Okay, I'll show you. Let's talk about anything you want to, as long as you want to. Nicky, do you remember what you said when I first met you? Mm-hmm. What did you say? Well? Nicky. Nicky, are you sleeping very good. Good night, Nicky, darling. The hair-raising adventures of Sam Spade, detective. Brought to you by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Sam 
Sam's State Detective Agency. It's me, Effie. Oh, Sam, I've been worried about you. Sid Weiss was just on the phone, and he says beating up a corpse without a permit is against the law. It's all right, Effie. I just dug him up to say hello and put him back again. Oh, Sam. I'll be down in a couple of minutes to dictate my report, sweetheart. If I get lost on the way, you'll find me in City Hospital, the psycho ward, third straight jacket from the left. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented each week by Wild Root Cream Oil, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that will put your hair back in place again, grooming it neatly, naturally, the way you want it. Fellows... If a girl can spend half an hour under a hot dryer in a beauty parlor to look her best for you, certainly you can spend half a minute sprucing up with Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic to look your best for her. That's all it takes, and Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, the way girls like to see it. Besides, it relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff. There's not a drop of alcohol in Wild Root Cream Oil. It contains lanolin. So get the big economy-sized bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. And now, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Date, August 2nd, 1946. To Mrs. Gregory Denov. Subject, Death of Dr. Denov. I was sitting in my office with nothing to think about except a horse named Corkscrew Jr. My secretary, Effie Perrine, came in and said there was someone outside. I didn't look up from the dope sheet, so she said it again. Someone outside, Sam. What's he look like? Um, blue double-breasted custom-made suit, count of my tie, hand-tailored shirt, English shoes, hand-trimmed Van Dyke. Get me a blank check and send him in. Okay, Sam. Please come in. Mr. Spade will see you now, sir. Thank you. You are Mr. Spade. Sam Spade. What can I do for you? I'm Dr. Gregory Denov, a psychoanalyst. I I need your help. Lie down, doctor, and tell me all about it. <laughs> I, I see you might also be noted for your sense of humor as well as your discretion. Who told you I was discreet? A man named Nicolaitis. Well, you tell Nicolaitis, I think he's cute, too. What else does he say about me? That I can trust you with $10,000. Oh, is this Mr. Nicolaitis one of your patients? No, no, he isn't. As a matter of fact, he, he's got in possession of some private records of mine. Well, it, it's rather involved. Nicolaitis is shaking you down, and he picked me as the middleman, is that it? This is not an ordinary case of blackmail. Blackmail is blackmail, even if you do it in technicolor. Well, as you may know, a psychoanalyst keeps a faithful transcript, a detailed record of everything a patient says during consultation, no matter how intimate or shocking. Yeah. This man, Nicolaitis, has managed to gain possession of a copy of one of these case histories. The patient is a very celebrated person, and should this material be divulged, it may have very serious consequences for both my patient and and for me. Doctor, your best bet's the San Francisco Police Department. No, no, that's out of the question. Then I'm afraid I can't help you. Why not? Nicolaitis said I'm a private you... detective. When I take on a client, I take on his troubles. My job is to protect him, not to stand by and see him milk. You want to hire me on that basis? I'll listen. Oh, I'm, I'm so tired. I must trust somebody. What can you do for me, Mr. Spade? Write me out a check for $1,000. Get a pen? Yeah. All right. You see, Nicolaitis figures that if I'm getting a cut, I'll have to keep my mouth shut. I'll spend it all the same. Here you are. Thanks. Now, uh, what was the last thing Nicolaitis told you? That he would pick up the $10,000 here and deliver to you this file in question. Can you reach him? Yes. Call him. Tell him you've seen me. Tell him I won't do that kind of business in my office. Tell him to come to your house. I'll be there. What if he refuses? He won't. Tell him I have the whole 10000 What time? How about in an hour? No, no, I'm sorry. We'll have to make it around three or... Oh, goodness, I'm late now. I, I really... That's a beautiful watch, Mr. Denham. Yes. Foreign? Uh, yes. May I see it? My watch? Why, oh, really, Mr. Spade, I'm very late. I have so many things to do, and I have to be at the Majestic Theater well before the matinee starts at 2.30. Are you going to see me at 3 o'clock? Are you going to the theater? Oh, I'm not going to stay for the performance. 
Well, Mr. Spade, till three o'clock then. Oh, my office is in my apartment. The address is here on my card. It's the penthouse. Penthouse, huh? Okay, doctor, I'll come formal. I'll wear the top to my bathing suit. I left my office around 2.30 and started walking up Knob Hill. The Versailles Apartments, where Denhoff's place was, took up the whole 300 block, so I didn't have any trouble finding it. I stopped across the street for a minute to get my breath after the uphill climb, mopped my face, and started across. Just as I got to the middle of the street... The crowd was packed in so close around I couldn't see who'd done the brody, but I had a pretty good idea. The cops had the sidewalk roped off and guards posted at the building entrance. It took me maybe 20 minutes to elbow my way through and show my credentials. Sergeant Levine had the front door, so they let me in. Lieutenant Dundee of Homicide met me at the door of the penthouse. Hiya, Sam. What do you want? I want to see Dr. Denhoff. The doctor's dead. Dead? Yeah. He's my client. They can't do this to me. How? Hit a Brody out the window. What are you here for? To see his wife. Okay with you? Why not? She's inside. Thanks. <laughs> Mrs. Daniel, please. With all due respect for your grief, I must have the keys to the cabinet where Gregory kept his confidential files. You realize that he wished me to take charge of his patients and that I am responsible. All this police and so on. We must get those files out of here as soon as possible. <clears throat> yes? My name is Spade. I am Dr. Zoya. I was poor Dr. Denos' oldest friend. If there's anything I'd like to I... see you, Mrs. Denhoff, alone. <laughs> but you police have already asked us so many questions. You see, she's not in the... I'm not with the police. I'm a private detective. I was working for Dr. Denhoff. A private detective? <laughs> he was in trouble, you see. You see, Dr. Sawyer, the police won't believe me. Mm. Mr. Spade, you'll tell them. You'll tell them he didn't commit suicide. Well, Mrs. Denhoff, I guess that takes care of everything here. It's clearly suicide. <laughs> I'm stupid idiot. Suicide. My husband, he treated suicides. He would never... No, please. It will be all right, my dear. I'm sorry. She's hysterical. Yeah. If I had the time, I would... Tell them. Tell them. Please, Mrs. Daniel. The undertaker has been arranged for a burial at 7 o'clock, the Israel Cemetery. Now, please, the key to Gregory's file. Here, take it and go. Go ahead, all of you. Okay, we'll, we'll call you now. I'm so sorry, gentlemen. This is hysteria. A simple traumatic condition. If I only had the time. <laughs> Who can I turn to? Who will help me? You think it's pleasant? You think my husband would rest if they said I committed suicide? What shall I do? What shall I do? What shall I do? Oh, oh you. Dr. Zoya didn't have the time, neither have I. You think it's murder? Who do you think kills your husband? To name someone. That's a very serious charge, Mr. Speed. Goodbye, Mrs. Denhoff. Constance Brent. You mean Constance Brent, the actress? Yes. Yes, she was his last patient this morning. She had threatened to kill him before. How do you know? My husband said so. Do you? Honey, well, he'd written it down on his notes on her case. Once before, she'd almost pushed him from that same window. How about your husband and Miss Brent? Oh, I knew she was falling in love with my husband. That always happens. They, they call it a transference. But in this your case... Your husband told me Miss Brent was acting in a play this afternoon over at the Majestic. Yes, Midsummer Night's Dream. But she was here. I know she was here. Miss Ray, the receptionist, was coming back from lunch when she heard voices arguing inside. And she was sure it was Miss Brent's voice. Show me the doctor's case history on Miss Brent. I can't. It's missing as soon as it happened, I went to the files. I meant to show it to the police. Who could have taken it? Constance Brent was the last one in that room before he died. Yeah. Why did you say Nicolaitis last? Nick who? Skip it. Uh, where can I reach you in case... For the next couple of hours, I'll be at the Majestic Theater. I want to see how good an actress this Constance Brent is. <laughs> Give me your hands if we be friends. 
Robin shall restore the man. Yes? Miss Constance Brent's dressing room? What do you want? I want to talk to Miss Brent. Well, you can talk to me. I'm her husband. So you're Mr. Brent. I'm Jonathan Wallace. She's Mrs. Wallace. Now, what do you want with my wife? I've come to tell her that Dr. Denhoff is dead. D- uh, are you sure? You tried falling from a 12th floor window sometime. Well, that's the best news I've heard this year. Then the fate would be a shock for Constance. Maybe, maybe not. She was the last person to see him alive, as far as anybody can make out. I... Are you from the police? No, uh, I'm from the insurance company. Claims investigator. What do you want to see Constance for? The policy wasn't made out to her, was it? No, made out to his widow. But she can't collect. Police say it was suicide. Oh, that's settled. This is the last time I take a penny. Stand around while Puck talks his head off. Who is this person? Darling, I'm afraid this is going to be a shock. This man is from an insurance company. Dr. Denhoff is dead. Oh, what a pity. What happened? The police say he jumped. His wife says he was pushed. She also says that you, Miss Brent, might have been the pusher. Oh, now, really, it's too absurd. How like a wife. What time did your play start this afternoon, Miss Brent? Nothing day at 2.30. Always. Always. And the late lamented Dr. Denhoff jumped at 3 o'clock. I didn't say he did. Doesn't this news, uh, shock you? But of course. Do you think good psychoanalysts are easy to find? Looks like your next doctor will have to start from scratch. Your case history seems to be missing from Dr. Denhoff's files. Missing? No. What is it? Has a man named Nicolaitis been in touch with you? I've never heard of him. Chances are you will. Does he have Dr. Denhoff's notes on my case? Could be. (gasps) This is frightful. Hot reading, huh? You seem to know this person, Nicolaitis. Get that file for me and I'll pay you well for it. Just a minute, my lovely Titania. We we don't know who this man really is. He might even be Nicolaitis himself. Let me see your company credentials. Now, what do you know? Somebody picked my pocket. My wallet's gone. I thought so. All right, you tell me who you are. I'll call the police. Oh, no, no, Jonathan. No police. Let's get off the merry-go-round. My name is Spade. You'll find me in the phone book under S. My office is open until 6 o'clock. And if a man answers, don't hang up. It'll be me. <laughs> Have you found a Nicolaitis yet? Not one. I even tried spelling it backwards. Ah, nobody ever heard of a man named Nicolaitis. I'm beginning to think there ain't no such person. Pardon me. Uh, do I hear my name mentioned? I'm Nicolaitis. Sam, I still think you're right. Come all the way in, Mr. Nicolaitis. Sit down. Oh, thank you. If you need me, Sam, just scream. What can I do for you? Oh, I've come for my money. What money? Of the $10,000, you remember the $10,000? Refresh my memory. Oh, Dr. Denhoff, the gentleman who visited you this morning? Oh, uh, that $10,000. Oh, you see, you see, you remember now. Yeah, yeah, it all comes back to me now. Uh, you were supposed to deliver something for the money. I think Dr. Denhoff is dead. That is no longer important. You will give me the money, please, and I will not disturb your afternoon any further. Suppose I refused. Oh, that would grieve me. In my grief, there is no telling what I might do. Dr. Dunlop's dead. There's nothing more you can do to hurt him. Oh, never would I attempt to hurt poor Dr. Dunlop. But in my sorrow, it would be so great if I should be forced to hurt the woman he lost. After all, as Titania says, these are the forgeries of jealousy. Titania, huh? Ah, yes, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, Act 1, Scene 18. <laughs> I'm a little rusty on my Shakespeare. Oh, you are indeed, Mr. Spade. Titania doesn't appear until well into Act 2. She doesn't, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. I guess she isn't on for 40 minutes or so. Yes, indeed, Mr. Spade, but I didn't come here to discuss drama. What else have you got to discuss? When Dr. Dunhoff died, your market died with him. That is a very unprogressive view, Mr. Spade. There's always a gentleman named Jonathan Ward. Why, you fiend. You don't mean you've sold to both of us. Mr. Spade, how can you have such a low opinion of me? I will prove my integrity. I will give you the material. You give me the money. Hand it over. In the event, Mr. Spade, we have a saying. He who goes too close to the bear soon loses his beard. 
I have left my beard at home. Okay, I'll meet you anywhere you say, anytime you say. Excellent. At seven in your apartment, hmm? Won't that be walking into the bear's cave? In the Levant, Mr. Spade, we have a saying. Private dicks do not kill people in their own apartment. It was then 6 p.m. I called Effie for messages. She told me that you had been phoning frantically, Mrs. Denov. I still had maybe 30 minutes before Nicolaitis was due at my apartment, so I breezed on up to your place on the hill. We had a very interesting chat. Uh, remember, Mrs. Denov? Looking back on it, that was probably the most interesting conversation we had. Funny, I can't remember much of anything you said, but it was so uh, cozy there in your place. And what with your clock being about 20 minutes slow, it must have been something like half past seven before I left you. I grabbed a cab and told the hacky to step on it. I hoped Nicolaitis was still waiting at my apartment. He was. <laughs> Mr. Nicolaitis, I'm sorry to be late. I... He was lying on my bathroom floor. The little guy was looking just about as natty as when he'd been in my office, except that the beautiful silk scarf he'd been wearing was twisted into a tight noose around his neck. Mr. Nicolaitis was a very dead blackmailer. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the fourth in a new series of programs bringing to the air for the first time the adventures of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Men, at the racetrack, the man who has something better than a mere hunch is said to have it straight from the horse. Of course, that's a humorous expression, but it shows how to get facts, go straight to the real source of information. And that's why we went straight to hundreds of men in metropolitan New York to find out what men really want in a hair tonic. And their answers show that Wild Root Cream Oil has all five advantages chosen by this impartial consumer jury of men. One, Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, never leaves it sticky or greasy. Two, Wild Root Cream Oil relieves annoying dryness. Three, it removes loose dandruff. Four, it's non-alcoholic. And five, it contains soothing lanolin. Remember... No other leading hair tonic gives you all five of these important advantages. Is it any wonder that four out of five users in a nationwide test preferred Wild Root Cream Oil to all other hair tonics they'd tried? So next time you visit your barber, ask for Wild Root Cream Oil and get the big economy-sized bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil at your drug or toilet goods counter. <laughs> Back to Sam and Psyche. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. His eyes were open and he seemed to be looking right at me as I bent over him. The finger marks in his throat were too blotchy to be of any use. Pretty soon, Lieutenant Dundee and Sergeant Polehouse came in and walked over behind me. We all stood there for a second and then Polehouse bent down and closed those eyes. You know him, Sam? His name is Nicolaitis. That's all I know about him. What did he come here to your place for? I don't know. You invited him? I wouldn't have been surprised to find him here, but not like this. You boys got a smear on him yet? Sure. He's an old customer of mine. Runs a photo lab. Photostats, microfilm. Microfilm. Nobody makes any sense. They're all screwballs, psychos, neurotics. What am I doing in the middle of this anyway? Sam, don't scream at us. We're just doing a job. Oh, I'm sorry, boys. It's... Dr. Denov was my client. An was... expert. That Denov probably had a screw loose somewhere and needed a psychoanalyst himself. Say, maybe he was... Yeah. Yeah. Hey, look, Dundee. Hmm? I'm going out of here now. Do I call Sid Weiss and we go through all that again, or are you going to let me walk? Why, Sam, you can go. I know where you sleep. I'll wake you when I'm ready for you. I want some answers, Dr. Sawyer, and you're the guy who can give them to me. I'm listening. 
Just let the questions flow into your mind and do not try to repress any of them. Speak instantly whatever... Okay, question number one, without thinking. Do you think Dr. Denhoff was a suicide? Well, I had not seen Dr. Denhoff for many years. He had been my student in Vienna. I was his analyst, in fact. That's all very interesting, Doctor, but my question... Yes, yes, sir. Did poor Dr. Denhoff commit suicide? I have reviewed all the material manifest and hypothetical, and I came to the conclusion... No, no, it was quite impossible. You see, these paranoid... Okay, and question dramatic... number two. Was uh, Dr. Denhoff in love with Constance Brent? I suppose I can now answer that question. When I arrived in San Francisco, I found him in great distress. He told me he feared he was losing his objectivity towards this patient. In other words, he was in love with her? Yes. You think she might have murdered him? All psychoanalytical subjects develop aggressive feelings toward the doctor. <laughs> Nearly all of my patients have threatened me at one time or another. You don't say. Uh, tell me, Dr. Zoya, you know anything about Jonathan Wallace, Miss Brent's husband? A violent type, almost psychotic. Yeah? How about you, uh, Dr. Zoya? Could you have done it? That is a most interesting question, Mr. Spade. When I arrived here from Vienna without funds, dependent on the kindness of my former students, I must confess that I felt a certain antagonism. It disturbed me to realize that a man of my standing in the profession should have be dependent on the goodwill of a younger and, <laughs> I sincerely believe, less gifted man. However, I overcame this, and I didn't kill him. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah, Doctor, thanks a lot. Oh, people, people. <laughs> Truly a life study. <laughs> there is no accounting. <laughs> For instance, Dr. Denhoff, he came to me only this afternoon with the strangest request. Yeah? He gave me the gold watch, the gold watch which I had presented to him many years ago upon his graduation in Vienna. He had a patient waiting and so had not much time to explain. Where is this watch? Please, I'm coming to that. He asked me to promise that I would have the watch buried with him if something should happen. That has been done. But Dr. Denhoff just died at three o'clock. It is a mosaic law that the deceased be buried before sundown. Uh -huh. Thanks, Doctor. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. I hope I've been of some help. Doctor, you'll never know how much you've helped me. Oh, what's happened? I think I got the answers, Mrs. Denhoff. That file on Constance Brent. Your husband knew that you'd been going through it. Oh, Mr. Spade. Shut up and listen to me. He took it out of the files, had it microfilmed for his own private records, and destroyed the original. Really? The man who did the microfilming was Nicolaitis. He delivered one print to your husband and kept another for himself. He was murdered in my apartment for the copy he used to shake down your husband. The killer now has that copy, if it hasn't already been destroyed. But we can still put our hands on the first strip of microfilm, which you delivered to your husband. This is astonishing. How? It's in the gold watch, which was buried with him. Uh, oh, the, the watch that Dr. Zoya... Zoy... That's right. Denhoff made up his mind that whatever he knew about Constance Brent was going to go to the grave with him. What are you doing tonight? Uh, nothing. And we got a date, sweetheart, you and I. I'll be back toward the wee hours. All paths lead to the grave. Ophelia, Act 6. Gregory's grave? But shouldn't we get a court order and have it done properly? The courts don't open until 10 in the morning, sweetheart. And Lieutenant Dundee's going to start asking me some questions about that stuff in my apartment before then. You see, baby, I can't wait. <laughs> We shouldn't be doing this. I'm wrong. This time it won't be wasted effort. I'll crawl into the grave myself and pull it in after. Here. I struck it. Give me that crowbar, Mrs. Denhoff, quick. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. 
Put that flashlight in here, sweetheart. You look the other way. Yeah. Yeah, here it is. Look. What, Mr. Speed? What have you got? The watch. Here, put the flash on it while I open it. Uh, here's my nail file. Pry off the back. Thanks. That does it. Here's the film. All right, Mr. Speed. Give me that film. Well, if it isn't the second gravedigger from Hamlet, Mr. Constance Brent. Stop crowding and hand it up to me. You better do as he says, Mr. Spade. We've both got guns. I was expecting that. It took you a long time to get here, Mr. Wallace. How did dear Constance make out as Lady Macbeth? Just give me that film. Stop being an idiot, Wallace. The cemetery is crawling with cops. Put that gun away before you drop it and break your foot. Come up out of that grave, Spade, or you'll stay there forever. Okay, Dundee. All right. Get those hands up, everybody. Go ahead, Dundee. Make the pinch. Okay. Sam Spade, I arrest you for body snatching violation of graves under the civil code number... No, you fool. You're supposed to arrest Mrs. Gregory huh? Denov and Jonathan Wallace for the murder of Gregory Denov and Pericles Nicolaitis. But I... Oh, yeah, yeah. I... No, you don't. I... Smart of you, Mrs. Denov, to make me late for my appointment with Nicolaitis. You did that so that Wallace could nail him in my apartment for the microfilm. You thought you could use that film to pin Denov's murder on Constance Brent. But after your late husband caught you tampering with his files, he added a few well-chosen words to it so that the film put the finger on you and your boyfriend, Mr. Wallace, in case anything happened to the doctor. So Wallace had to kill Nicolaitis. You weren't smart to push your husband out the window. That looked like suicide. You might have gotten away with it, Mrs. Denov, if you'd bashed your husband's head in with a bottle. Uh, it reminds me, Effie, pour me a drink. That all? Sign it, put a special delivery on it, and send it care of the matron to Hatchapi Prison. Go on, have one yourself. Oh, thank you. Here's how. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. You'll get used to it. <laughs> Good night, Sam. <laughs> Good night, sweetheart. Wild Root Cream Oil presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Fred Essler was Dr. Zoya. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Don't forget, next Friday, the three masters of the art of hair-raising, Dashiell Hammett, William Spear, and Wild Root Cream Oil, join forces to bring you another hair-raising adventure with Sam Spade. No, Nicky, darling, that's not it. It isn't, Nora? No, it goes like this. Thirty-three fine brews blended into one great beer. Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer presents The New Adventures of the Thin Man with Nick and Nora Charles, the happiest, merriest married couple in radio. <laughs> Tuesday night at this same time, that international favorite, Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer, proudly presents the finest in summertime entertainment. So sit back, relax, and pour yourself a tall, foaming glass full of blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. While you listen to the stars of our show, Claudia Morgan as Nora and Les Tremaine as Nick, in tonight's adventure of the Thin Man, entitled The Adventure of the Passionate Palooka. <laughs> It's one o'clock in the morning of one of those sizzling July nights that make the average New Yorker feel like a hot dog on a griddle with mustard. We find our hero, Nick Charles, tossing restlessly in his bed and mumbling to himself. Uh, I wonder if I ought to get in order to hit me on the head with one of my old blackjacks. Oh, no, she'd enjoy that too much. Oh, you nuts. Of course, Nora is twitching away in her bed, too. And when she notices that Nick's managed to close his eyes and doze off, she mumbles sweetly to herself. 
He can't do that to me, the big goon. What right has he got to sleep in a night like this and leave me alone in my misery? And so, with genuine wifely devotion, she gently wakes Nick up. Nick! There's a fire! Hmm? What'd you say? Fire? Yes, a fire! How? When? Where? On my sheets, and I'm cooking. Were you asleep? Yes. I thought so. Is that why you woke me? Well, you had no right to do it without telling me how. Do what? Fall asleep. Well, dear, I I thought of hundreds of people diving into swimming pools. Female people? (laughs) Why, yes. They they were all beautiful. They all looked like you. Oh, nice. Maybe I'll think of hundreds of you jumping into a pool. Well, that's a great idea. Makes me feel cooler already. You're making your first leap. You're diving. I look like a swan, huh? You land flat on your tummy. You must be thinking of someone else, Nora. I never dive like that. Now you're under the water. Uh, What stroke am I doing? You've disappeared. Hey, wait a minute. Uh, Don't I come up? No, I can't see you. Nora, get me out of here. I'm drowning. (laughs) I'm diving in after you. The crowds are applauding. Hurry, will you? I'm fishing around for you. I'm over here. I've got you. Hey, let go. You're pulling my hair. Keep quiet. I'm rescuing you. Nora, baby, you're being carried away. You're Uh, pulling me out of bed by the hair. That's the way you rescue people, you ghoul. But I haven't got that much hair left. Cut it out. Let me drag you to the shore first. I'm on the floor, Nora, dear. Or is it the shore? It's the shore. Everyone is pinning medals on me and saying, what did she ever want to rescue him for? Oh, nuts. Now you've just about ruined all my chances of ever falling asleep. That's a fine thing to say to a wife who just saved your life. Who wants to sleep tonight anyway? What do you think we should do? Let's go out. Go out? Mm -hmm. At this hour? Nora, do you want me to become the kind of a bum I used to be? Mm Mm-hmm. Just for tonight. (laughs) Okay, baby. Nick the Dick prowls again. Nick, aren't you glad we came out? Look, the whole town's up. Yeah. And look what we're walking into, a band of serenaders. <laughs> hey, Bud, would you and your girl like to find a way to forget the heat? We certainly would, Mr. Uh, Bud. Then join the Gutter Glee Club for unmusical verses. Oh, I'd like to, but won't you get into trouble singing in front of that apartment house? For the astronomical rents they pay in that joint, they deserve a little music. <laughs> Come on, Mickey, you know plenty of wrong notes. Let's sing. All right. By the This is Who, Who's breaking it up, Nora? The man on the seersucker who just ran out of the building. Come on, go on, go on, scram, oh, or I'll really? call the cops. The trouble with you, buddy, is you ain't got no joy in your heart. But I got two musical ears on my head. Go on, skedaddle, go oh, on. Oh, Nick, there's a man who would put the harps in heaven out of tune. I think I know that guy. And if you do, you shouldn't. He looks so grouchy, I bet he bites himself for breakfast every morning just to make sure he feels sore. Well, well, what are you waiting for? A contribution? Oh. Aren't you Scoot Skillet, the fight manager? Yeah, what if I get... Nick! Nick Charles! <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Where'd she get her? Oh, I, I figured I needed a manager, so I let her sign me up for life. Glad to know you, Mrs. Charles. <laughs> Hey, say, Nick, uh, you want to get a piece of something good? I'll sell you half of Adam Baum Brickenhead for only two grand. Well, who's Adam Baum Brickenhead? My sensational new fighter who's meeting the champ tomorrow night. Oh. Which half of this prize fight are you selling? <laughs> She's the educated type who don't know nothing about nothing, huh, Nick? <laughs> I mean, a half interest. Why should you want to sell before the big fight, Scoots? I need money bad. What do you say, Nick? No dice. What's wrong with Brickenhead? Yet yeah, this... How'd you guess? Because you wouldn't sell a half interest in the right time if you could make a buck at it. Well, then maybe you can help me. Listen, the atom bomber just ain't himself. Nobody can find out what's eating him. Being as you're a detective, maybe you can find out, Nick. Where he is, Mr. Adam Baum? Upstairs. Well, just what's wrong with him? Even the doctors can't find out. They says it's all in his mind. So I calls in a mind specialist. A head doctor. And you know what he tells me? What? That the atom bomber ain't got no mind. And this information costs me 25 bucks an hour. Of course we'll help you, Mr. Scoot. Come, Nicky, let's meet this mindless wonder. Hello, Scoot. Hello, sunshine. 
Palmer, I want you to meet Nick and Nora Charles. Oh, cheers. Hello, Mr. Adam Palmer. What's this cheers business? I heard it in a movie. It seemed so debonair. Oh, I'm so unhappy. Palmer, uh, suppose you tell us what's bothering you. Nothing. Except I'm miserable. Why are you miserable? Because I'm unhappy. But why are you unhappy? Because I'm miserable. See, it's it's a vicious cycle. Oh, me. But, Palmer, there must be some reason why you're groaning like a sick cow. I wish I was a cow. Well, you've got the voice for it, but your figure's wrong. Yeah, yeah, there's a catch to everything, ain't there? Oh, just a second. Why do you wish you were a cow? Why not? I wish I was anything as long as I ain't me. But what's wrong with you? Nothing hurts me nowhere, Doc. Listen, no mind. These ain't doctors. They're detectives. I thought they might help you. Well, nobody can help me. Not even Betty Gritt. Detectives? Did you say detectives? Why, yes. Detectives. Look, Nick. He's coming to life. He don't look dead no more. He looks dumb, like he used to be. Scoots, uh, leave me alone with these two people. I I gotta talk to them alone. What's the matter? You don't trust me no more? No, but I'm I'm temperamental. I'm trained to a fine part. Nervous and and high-strung, like an underbred thoroughbred. You are? I know I am, because I read about me in tonight's sports page. Now, now, uh, leave me alone with them. Okay, Bomber. Nick. Nora. You're the only two peoples in the world who can help me. Can we? I didn't want to tell no one before because no one thinks I got any brains, which is true. You see, Nick, it's Jojo. I love Jojo. Well, what happened to Jojo? She's gone. She left me. Why? I don't know. I always treated her good. I, I never even kicked her. Not even once. How sweet of you. I never even kept her chained up. Hey, maybe I should have chained her up, huh, Nick? Well, there are two schools of thought about that, but it's good for some females. Yeah. Whenever she got hungry, I always threw her a bone. Well, how generous of you. What's that? What kind of a dame are you in love with? A high-class kind, of course. Who eats bones? Lulu don't eat bones. She eats caviar. Lulu? But we were talking about Jojo. How many people do you love, Mr. Atombomber? Just three. Me, Jojo, and Lulu. Uh, now, let's take him one at a time. Who's Jojo? Just the most beautiful mongrel dog I ever found in alley, that's all. And I love her. When did the dog disappear? On the night I fought with Lulu. Oh, Lulu's a prize fighter. No, but she should be with the right she's got. Lulu is a girl. Jojo is a dog and me. Me, I'm a rare phenomenon. You are? That's what the doctor said I was. Nick, Nora, promise me you won't tell nobody what's wrong with me. Not even scoots. Why? Well, if everybody knew how I felt about Jojo, they'd think I was dumber than I really am. Can I help it if I love dogs? We'll keep your secret. And now, will, will you find Jojo for me? How can I win the world's championship tomorrow night? Knowing Jojo is walking the street with no one to scratch her fleas. Look at me. Take pity on me. I'm, I'm wallowing in woe. I'm crying. We'll find your doggy, Mr. Adam Bomber, before tomorrow night. Mrs. Childs. You're a dear, sweet poison. Almost as sweet as... as Jojo. Nicky, darling, what makes you think we can find a dog in a nightclub like this? I mean, a dog who not only bites, but barks. Beautiful. Have you ever heard of Banana Nose Norbert? Is it an ice cream sundae or a relation of Jimmy Durante? <laughs> He's the guy who owns this dive, and he practically runs the underworld of this town. We became friends when I sent him up the river years ago. Nick, you promised me that we were going to live in the upper world from now on. I was afraid you'd object. That's why I brought you here before I told you the reason. Nora, baby, it isn't as if this was a detective case or something, but do you think that dog disappeared by accident? You mean the poor pooch is the victim of dog snatchers? Well, do you think smart gamblers would stop at stealing a dog if they knew the effect it would have on the atom bomber? Hello, Nick. Wait a said you wanted to see me. Oh, banana nose. Uh, this is my wife, Nora. 
Well, well, well. Well, wonders never cease. You're the first guy who ever came into this joint with a beautiful tomato that he was actually married to. Why, thank you, Mr. Banana Nose. <laughs> you don't mind that I called you tomato, Mrs. Charles? No, if you don't mind my calling you Banana Nose. Nah. Banana nose and tomato. We ought to get together and open a vegetable store. <laughs> That's <pretty> funny. <laughs> hey, listen, Banana Nose. I'm looking for the pup that was stolen from Adam Bomb Brickenhead. Oh, yeah? Why? We promised to return him. Without that dog, Mr. Adam Bomb is so depressed he'll hardly be able to fight tomorrow night. Oh, oh. So that's why the odds went down against him. You know, Nick, a few weeks ago, the experts figure him to beat the champ. He will beat the champ if he has his doggy. Ah. And if he does, someone named me can clean up a load of loops. Nick, your worries are over. They are? Just tell me what the pooch looks like, and by tomorrow morning, you will have that dog in your apartment for breakfast. <laughs> You are listening to the new adventures of The Thin Man, presented for your summertime entertainment by the makers of that international favorite, Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer. Just before our program started tonight, you heard on your radio those NBC chimes. You know, that bing, bong, bell. Now, you've probably heard that NBC musical signal 150 times or more. And every time you've heard it, bing, bong, bell, it made exactly the same sound. Well... I can't think of a better way to illustrate the uniformity of Pabst Blue Ribbon. If you enjoy a good glass of beer, you've probably ordered Pabst Blue Ribbon 150 times or more. And I'm sure you noticed every glassful was exactly alike. Not too heavy, not too light, but fresh, clean, sparkling. With the real beer flavor coming through just the way you like it. Now, how does Paps keep it that way year after year? <laughs> well, I can sing the answer to that one, too. Thirty-three fine brews blended into one great beer. Yes, that Paps blending process is costly, and it takes infinite patience, but the result? Well, I'll leave it to your sense of taste. Why not order a few cans or bottles and learn why millions the world over have settled down to blended, splendid Paps Blue Ribbon? Relax, and let's catch act two of tonight's Thin Man Adventure. Nick and Nora Charles have promised to find Jojo, the mongrel pooch whose mysterious disappearance has broken the heart of Adam Bomber Brickenhead, the heavyweight challenger who lacks a mind. It's now 11.30 in the morning, and we find our hero and heroine at breakfast. Nicky... You know what I dreamed about last night? Huh. Dogs? Yes. How'd you find out? I dreamed about them, too. Well, darling, tonight Mr. Adambaum goes into the ring to battle for the championship. And he's still dogless. Well, don't worry, dear. Banana Nose Norbert won't fail us. He said he'd have the dog here for breakfast. We're having breakfast. And no dog. Oh, now, Nora, you mustn't take it so to heart. Oh, why not? Poor Mr. Adam Bomber. Without a mind, without a dog, and with a broken heart. What's he got? Cauliflower ears, 200 pounds of solid muscle, and uh, an appealing personality. I think Lulu's behind the whole thing. The Adam Bomber's girlfriend? Mm -hmm. But they're in love with each other. Why should she pull a mean trick like uh, dog napping? Well, I'm in love with you, and I do mean things to you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Why do you do them? Because I love you, Madge. Besides, they had a fight. Wait, wait a minute. Listen. It's a dog. Unless I'm hearing things, too. There are two dogs. One's a coloratura soprano, and the other is a basso profundo. Well, Nick, it's a full operatic ensemble. Nora, th this can't be. This thing has affected our minds. We've gone pooch potty. Oh, but one of the dogs is ringing our bell. Just a minute. Hiya, Nick Banana Nose. I told you I'd have a dog for you. Got my voice around the ball, it could find. Hey, you dog, shut up. Hey, Spike, make them dogs obey me. Don't they know who I am? Come in, Banana. Let the dogs rest in the hall. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Charles. The Banana Nose never fails. I got the pooch, I think. So I heard. What made you do this? <laughs> oh, I ain't no dope. With these low odds on the atom bomber, there's going to be plenty in it for old Banana Nose when we find the doggy and the atom bomber wins the fight. Yeah, I see your angle. 
But Banana Nose, I thought you'd figured some gambler took the pooch. I checked on that angle. The hound was not hijacked. So I figured he was on the loose, since the dog society didn't pick him up. It isn't a him dog. It's a her. A tomato? Mm Mm-hmm. Jojo is a female. (laughs) Well, I'll be (laughs) doggone. I forget there was two kinds. I told them to pick up all the black and white mongrels they could find, no matter what kind of personalities they had. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll bring the dogs in, and I'll have the atom bomber come down and see if he can identify one of them. Are you going to bring that mob of mongrels in here, Nicky? Well, what can we do, Nora? We've got to be good hosts. Well, you can stay here with them, Nick. I know what I'm going to do. Where are you going, Nora? To investigate my own angle on this dog napping. I'll call you up, darling. I'll sneak out the back way. Goodbye. Uh, Nora! Well, Nick, shall I bring him in? Well, I guess so. <laughs> okay, you mugs, send in all the girl dogs. Good evening. Good evening. Are you Miss Lulu Laverne? I am she. Well, I'm Mrs. Nora Charles. Pleased to meet you, I think. Uh, entree. French. That means come in and also something expensive to eat in high-class continental dumps. It does? Yeah. Are you interested in culture? Well, I suppose so. Culture's my latest passion. Well, I thought Mr. Adam Baum Brickenhead was that. Oh. What do you know about it? He told me about you, Lulu. He did, did he? Mm-hmm. Well, whatever he said, it's a foul and delicious canary. You mean malicious canard? Oh, trying to outculture me, are you? No, Lulu, I'm just trying to find Mr. Adam Bomber's dog. Well, what did you come here for? Do I look like a dog catch? Don't answer that. Lulu, all day long, poor Mr. Adam Bomber's been trying to identify his dog. Hundreds of dogs have been brought to my house. So far, his hasn't turned up. Not even one of them poachers is Jojo? Not one. If he goes into the fight without Jojo, he'll just be killed. That's great. I know you took the dog. Oh, so I'm a dog thief now. The doorman of this apartment house saw you with the dog. And after the tip I gave him for Christmas. But he didn't see me with Jojo. He saw me with my own dog, Chi-Chi. He saw you with two dogs. That must have been the night he seen me with the Atom Bomber. The Atom Bomber isn't two dogs. He is so. You don't know him as good as I do. Lulu, you just say those things because you had a fight with him. Sure. Can you give me a better reason? And on the day you had a fight, you took the dog out for a walk and you told him she ran away. She did. Why? Because we girls just didn't get along together. And besides, no man should love another female as much as he loved that dog, even if she has got a better pedigree than I got. Lulu, you're jealous of Jojo. Me? Jealous of a pooch? What's she got? Dog skin. I got mink. Lulu, you know where that dog is, and I'm going to see that you return her. (laughs) You can't scare me. Hey, who are you called? My husband. He'll make you confess. That's unfair. You can't turn a man loose on me. You can see I'm the type that men can melt. Nick. Good heavens, who answered the phone? Nick! Hello, Nora, baby. I thought the dogs answered the phone for a moment. Well, they've done everything but that. Banana Nose and his boys keep bringing them in by the dozens. Hey, hey, get down. Have you found Jojo among them? Uh, No. Uh, The atom bomber's here. He's dazed from the dogs and scared to go into the ring. Hey, don't fight! Nick, come up here to Lulu's place right away. I'm sure she's got the dog. Okay, Lulu's place. Uh, Wait a minute. The atom bomber's got to rush to the fight now. Hey, hey, bomber, you want to say something to your girl, Lulu? Yeah. Uh, Hello, Lulu. Uh, I love old Lulu. Uh, I'm glad to hear it, Mr. Bomber. But this is Nora. Lulu, come here and say something nice to him. He's got to rush to the fight now. Encourage him. I sure will. Hello. Bama? Lulu, I'm so miserable. Oh. And my best wish is that the champ should mighty in the first round. Lulu, what a wish. What are you complaining about? If you croak in round one, you won't have to finish the fight. Goodbye. <laughs> television broadcast of the World Championship fight, and the Atom Bomber has covered the champ with blood. (laughs) That is, the Atom Bomber's blood. Lulu, 
Nora and I have brought you to this beer parlor to see what you've done to the poor Adam Bomber. Yes, Lulu. Look at him. He looks terrible. Ah, that's the television set. It ain't perfected yet. Folks, as you look at the face of the Adam Bomber, don't think your television set is broken. It's just what the champ did to him. Oh, boy, he's really a mess, eh? There's the bell, folks, and we're off for another round of slaughter. Here comes the Adam Bomber. He dived right into the champ's right. Oh, stop him back, Bomber! The Bomber's tired of the champ, right? So he's aiming his head at the champ's left. Ha, <laughs> ha! Oh, the poor Bomber! Nick, she's breaking down. I can't bear to see his ugly face falling like that. All right, I'll give you the poop. She's in a dark hotel on a honeymoon with my dog. Come on, I'll show you where. Here's Jojo. Thanks, Doc. Nick and Nora, can we still get to the fight on time? Yes, Lulu. Scoots has some ringside seats for us, right near the atom bomber's corner. So this is Jojo. How do you like being a bride, Jojo? <laughs> Come on, you three gushing girls. We've got to rush. We got here in time. Look, the bomber is still alive. Yes, he's resting between the rounds. Nora. Yes, dear. You sit here with Lulu. I'm going to take Jojo to the bomber's corner. All right. Hey, Scooch. Bomber. Look what I've got here. Hey, Scooch. Nip. Nick, don't bother me. We're trying to keep him conscious. I've got something that'll make him win the fight. Look, Nick, I ain't got time. This boy of mine needs everything but a blood transfusion. Scooch, I'll buy that half interest in your boy for two grand. Sold. I'll sell you the half above the waist. That's completely dead wood. It's a deal. Now let me talk to my half of my boy. Okay, okay, here. Bomber. Bomber, look what I've got under my arm. Jojo. My little doggy, Jojo. Yes, your girl Lulu had her. She took her because she thought you loved her more than you loved her. That ain't true. I love my dog just as much as I love my girl. And Lulu loves you, too. And there she is. She came here to watch you win the championship. Lulu? Oh, boy, I'm going to kill that champ. I'm going to murder him. My fighting spirit is returning. Nothing can stop me now. Okay, I'm going back to our seats. Go in there and win, Bar. Nick! Nick! I'm coming, baby. Did you tell the bomber what happened? Yes, Nora. Did it do any good? Good. You just watch, Lulu. As soon as he saw you and the dog, he was practically resurrected. Resurrected? Is that good? It's going to be sensational. There's the bell. Look at him go. Knock him in the head, Bomber. Give him the old one, too. Oh, boy, there goes the bomber. Look at him swing. Yes. Look at him miss. Look at him receive that ball up from the gym. Look how nicely he falls. Get up, Bomber. That's right, Bomber. Stay there and take a nice oh. rest. Uh, Take a rest, Bomber. He isn't resting, Nora. He's unconscious. Don't be silly. He's being small. Get up, Bomber. Jojo, bark at him. He's firing. Nora, he was knocked out. But but that's impossible. We did everything like they do in the movies, and it never ends this way. It's it's a foul. Foul! <laughs> I'm afraid the bomber is down for the count. Now, if Nikki and Nora are smart, they'll go on home and have themselves a cold, refreshing bottle of that blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. The beer with the fresh, clean, sparkling flavor. You know, Pabst Blue Ribbon is quite a home favorite with happily married couples. Just to mention a few, there's Mr. and Mrs. Gregory Peck, Mr. and Mrs. Bob Hope, Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence Melchior and Miss Gladys Swarthout and her husband, Mr. Frank Chapman. Now, these people can certainly afford the best of everything. And the fact that Pabst Blue Ribbon is served in their homes is a tribute to its quality. I could tell you about Pabst's 104 years of leadership in the art of brewing and explain how Pabst developed the science of blending. Yes, blending 33 fine brews to keep the same identical Blue Ribbon flavor and quality in bottle after bottle, year after year. But I'd rather you'd simply taste it yourself. By tasting, by comparing, you'll understand why millions the world over have settled down to blended, splendid Paps Blue Ribbon. <laughs> Now 
for the conclusion of tonight's Thin Man Adventure. Hello, Nicky, darling. Where have you been? To see Scoots and pay him for my half of the bomber. Oh. How is he? Very happy. He wishes there were more people like me in the world and uh, less fighters like the bomber. That's not nice. <laughs> the bomber really tried hard. Yes, I know. The bomber says he would have won the fight if the champ didn't get in his way so much. I know. But, it, but is it Mr. Bomber's fault if there was another man in the ring? <laughs> Anyway, I'm glad to hear he's going to marry Lulu. When did you find that out? Oh, well, Lulu phoned a few minutes ago. Well, that's one match I hope he'll win. Nora. Hmm? Nora, darling, what are you knitting there? Uh, can't you guess? Why, it, 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 it looks like a, a little garment. Nora, don't tell me. Yes, it's true. Jojo's going to have puppies. Well, then congratulate me. Why? <laughs> After what I went through with that dog, I practically feel like a father. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like another hot night tonight. Mm. And if we can't sleep, I know just what to do now. Hmm? Go out again? No, <laughs> we'll get into too much trouble that way. We'll each have a glass of ice-cold Pabst Blue Ribbon beer, and then I'll do this. And say good night, Nikki, darling. Be sure to listen next Tuesday night when Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer brings you another happy, exciting Thin Man adventure with Les Tremaine and Claudia Morgan. Next week, the adventure of the haunted hams. When Nick and Nora go to the country and discover that livestock aren't the only stock in barns during the summer. The Adventures of the Thin Man is brought to you by the Pabst Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Newark, New Jersey, and Peoria, Illinois. And this is Ed Hurley saying good night with the best wishes of Pabst Blue Ribbon Dealers from coast to coast. <laughs> Me. Oh, Sam, it's you. On the filter and in the flesh. Any messages, phone calls, letters, or telegrams? Or just the usual. A bill to the landlord and a notice from the telephone company. Well, I'll dispose of them as usual. You sound awfully chipper. Have you been on a case, Sam? Did you make some money? Yes, I've been on a case. No, I did not make any money. Oh, your client got murdered before he could pay you? Wrong again. My client was a woman. She did not get murdered and she could pay me. Huh? And she did. But you just said she didn't. True, I think it's true. Things are not what they seem. I know, it's confused. You just said that... And I meant every oh. word of it. Stop registering bewilderment. Oh. All, all is paradox. So, uh, sharpen your pencils, straighten your seams, get out your notebook, and prepare to be confounded by the contradictions I shall contradictate to you during my report on the honest thief caper. I'm not looking over for the pleasure. Oh, oh, oh. Look at that girl. We've many things to do. Up, up. Yes, yes. You say the strangest things on the phone. Don't right? I? I don't believe I quite understood what it was all about. A natural misunderstanding. I didn't understand it myself. Uh, uh, date? Uh, Two. Uh, Sergeant Frank Milgus, uh, robbery details, San Francisco police. Uh, I'm not very last. I'm not very last. You're fast today. Subject: uh, Ben Kamiski. Ben Comiskey, C-O-M-I-S-K-I. Sam, I went to Elbert High School with a boy named Ben Comiskey. Is he the same one? Very likely, yes. Yeah. Oh, Sam, tell me, did he turn on back? Is he good? Did he get married? Down, Effie. Oh, Sam, I need yeah. this boy. I want to know. This is one mystery you're not going to solve by reading the last chapter first. Dear Frank, it was one of those days. The sky was black and it looked like rain, but... When I put on my trench coat, the sun came out. At breakfast, it looked like I'd ordered fried eggs, and I wound up with pancakes. Also, I discovered I was wearing one blue sock and one black one. After that, I gave a cab driver a five instead of a one and let him ride off with a change. And there was one other thing. Sam, bank just called. You're overdrawn. I'm nuts, Jeff. I made a deposit two days ago. I checked, Sam. It didn't. You're nuts, too. I made out the slip myself, and I... 
Oh. <laughs> Give me some. I'll take it right down. Uh, yeah, better do that, Angel. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh. Can I help you, Miss? Is it is this Mr. Spade? All right, come right in, Miss. Sit down. Uh, uh, Miss Perrine, you may go and uh, uh, do that. Hmm? Uh, instruct them that if such a mistake occurs again, I shall take my account elsewhere. Yes, now, uh, uh, please sit down, Miss. Uh... My name's Louise Miller, Mrs. Spade. I, I want to hire you. How much will it cost? Well, now, Miss Miller, let's uh, let's talk about it a little bit. I first. haven't much time, Mrs. Spade. I have to be at the office in a half an hour, and I have to cross town. You see, I... well, Mama thinks I should forget all about him, but I, I can't. And I... Well, here I've I've got ninety five dollars. Will you please do something? Something. Come on now, come on. I'm sorry. I... That's all right. Now, uh, who is he? What's he done? And why does Mama want you to forget him? Ben. Ben Comiskey. Hmm. I... Well, we were going to be married pretty soon. We, we even picked out our furniture. We... No, no, no. It's all right now. Go on. What's he done? I'm saying he held up a store two nights ago to... He picked him up on the street today. He's, he's in jail. Mm-hmm. Well, if he's innocent, I'm sure they'll find that out. He, he won't even see me, Mr. Spade, and you. He won't see anyone. Ben's good and kind and sweet, and I love him, and I want to marry him. And I want you to find out why he, what it's all about. Look, Miss Miller, I, I think you should be in the office of a good lawyer. I'm sure. He doesn't want a lawyer. He, he won't even see the public defender. He, he doesn't want anything. Oh, please. Please, Mr. Spade, I just want to die if Ben went to prison. I, I just want to die. <laughs> I'm uh, no sentimentalist, but faith is a thing we're a little short on these days, so we came to terms. It was agreed she could pay me after the job was done if there was any job to do. She left for work, and I phoned you, Sergeant Milgus, and found out Ben Comiskey had already been arraigned and was being held in the city jail. When I dropped in 20 minutes later, you walked me back to his cell. What's it all about, Ben? I don't know. Just looking into it. Hey, he won't tell you anything. No? Kept his trap shut all the time he's been here. As far as we've been able to find out, no previous record, no background. Well, maybe it isn't so bad for him at that, huh? First degree, Sam. Vickers saw a proprietor, a man named Potter, over on Army Street. Identified him in the morning lineup. Mm-hmm. Just like that. Picked him out of a dozen guys we hauled in. Then what? Yeah, we'd send a couple of the boys out to Comiskey's room and find all the dough in the dresser drawer, 900 clams. Now what? Take it easy, Comiskey. This is Sam Spade. He wants to talk to you. Ben Comiskey was tall, dark complexioned, about 29 or 30 years old. His hair was black, straight, and closely cropped. His faces were regular, not good, not bad. I've seen plenty of hold-up men and gun toters in my day, and he wouldn't have been cast in the part in my movie. I didn't know what I expected to say to him or what I expected him to say to me, but I didn't expect what I got. What are you trying to do? Get out of here. I just got here, Ben. Well, you can just leave. Hasn't a citizen got any rights, even in jail? Well, they start to lose them, and they use a gun to make a living. I don't want any lectures. I haven't got any to hand out. I'm a private detective. A friend of yours hired me. She thinks you're a pretty nice guy. Louise, huh? Why won't you see her? She's nuts. She ought to have a head felt. What's she worrying about anyway? I'd say she was worrying mostly about you. And I'd say it's the sick kind of worry that gets into a girl when she loves somebody. She shouldn't. She's nuts. You said that. Did you uh, rob that store? The guy who runs it says I did. I suppose I did. Why? For laughs. The complaint says you make 65 bucks a week in an architect's office. You can eat on that. Look, Steve, go back and tell her this. I didn't want furniture at $10 a month for the next 80 months. I didn't want a car the same way. I didn't want her working and me working and getting nothing but wrinkles. Tell her I got caught and to go and find a guy who can pay the way. Was that all? That's enough. You're charged with armed robbery in the first degree. That means not less than five years. I know it. Shut up about it. Why'd you turn down a lawyer? Hadn't you heard, Spade? They're holding up my indictment. I'm a prize pigeon. They think maybe I knocked over 10 or 12 other places in town. Did you? Sure, sure. But don't worry about me. And tell Louise not to worry about me. Got a million bucks salted away, and I'm going to buy my way out through the DA's office. Okay. Have it your way, Ben.
But an hour later, I found myself strolling around Ben Comiskey's old neighborhood. A man named Gabrini, who owned a grocery store, remembered him and liked him. A woman in a bakery shop told me how he'd gone into the Army as a private and been discharged the first lieutenant. A phone call to a Mr. Henderson, a light architect, revealed that Ben Comiskey was in line for a raise and promotion. All in all, I was getting a composite picture that didn't look quite right. I decided to try his mother's place. It was on Lombard Avenue, a street that starts on the waterfront. According to the penciled note above the doorbell, it was out of order. The slot on the mailbox read, Mrs. Anastasia Comiskey. Yes. What is it, please? Uh, you're Mrs. Kamesky? I'm busy now. I just lunch for my son. He come back from Cincinnati. Please. Oh, uh, well, uh, Mrs. Kamesky, I'm here to talk to you about Ben. He's your son, too, isn't he? Yes. Ben is my son. Well, uh, I'm trying to help him, Mrs. Kamesky. Why? He has no money. I have no money. A friend of his, Louise Miller, hired me. Oh, Louise, she's a foolish girl. Very foolish. Her heart should not be with Ben. I think he's a very lucky man to be loved by somebody like that. If not for her, Ben would not be in jail, in trouble. Oh, you don't want to help my son. She don't want to help him. She'd leave him alone if she wanted to help. Ben is bad. Not good like my son James. James is always good. Times he's away, he sends me money. From what I hear, Ben's always been pretty good, too. Always one good son, one bad son. What's going on, Mom? Oh, who's this? He, he come to ask questions about Ben. Huh? I'm Jim Comiskey, Ben's brother. Where am I? Oh, uh, you run on in, Mom. <laughs> I'll talk to this gentleman. All right. Get out of here. Look, I'm just trying... If you've got any questions to ask about Ben, go to the police. They can give you all the answers. And stop bothering my mother. It's been through enough in the last two days. If I catch you around her again, I'll break you in half. The man who slammed the door in my face had the same angry look and the same angry glare of Ben Comiskey. The angry Comiskey brothers definitely wanted nothing that looked remotely like help, it seemed to this casual observer. I went back to my office to wait for 6 o'clock. That's when I intended to call my client, report my opinions, and drop the case. But at 5.30, she called me. Mr. State? Yeah? This is Louise Miller. Oh, yes. I was just going to call you. I'm afraid I haven't been able to do much. It looks like... I know, Mr. State. I, I just telephoned downtown. Ben pleaded... Ben pleaded guilty at the indictment this afternoon. He, he's going to be sentenced tomorrow. And that, to all appearances, Sergeant Milgers, was the crop. But two hours later, and for the second time in one day, I found myself doing what I didn't think I'd be doing, walking around a dull, gray, two-story apartment house on Adams Place. My ex-client's address, to be exact. I was wondering what a lonely, distraught girl would be thinking the night before her boyfriend was shipped away to prison. I found out. I got a whiff of it as I walked down the hall. It was coming out from under her door. I had to use my shoulder. The room was acrid and stinging with gas fumes. And Louise Miller was stretched out on the floor in a six-foot kitchen. When I picked her up and carried her out, I wasn't sure whether she was dead or not. Ten seconds after I'd found Louise Miller, I'd called a police ambulance, and in a matter of minutes, an intern was working over with a pull motor. Her breathing became regular and her pulse picked up, but she was still unconscious. Lieutenant Kelsey of Homicide showed up and said it was obviously a suicide attempt, which is his kind of ingenious thinking. I thought not. If she were going to commit suicide, she wouldn't have called first to pull me off the caper. She'd have let an insignificant detail like that take care of itself. Now, she was too strong to pity herself and too sure of what her intuition told her to believe even Ben Comiskey's confession. For that kind of faith, I owed it to her to poke around the ashes while they were still hot. I did. And turned up a live coal in a faded blue shirt and wrinkled brown pants. Bert Singleby, by name and by vocation, manager of the Greystone Arms Apartments. What kind of a girl was she? Oh, nice, clean, sincere. The kind mothers always want their sons to marry. Boy, I wish I'd listen to mine. Yeah, uh, did you know her boyfriend, Ben Comiskey? Oh, salt hors d'oeuvre. Huh? I can't understand him pulling a hold up like that. But then, you know, the war did strange things to people. <laughs> I guess it yeah. did. Well, I almost stayed in Europe and married myself up to a French doll myself. Yeah, I bet. Uh, but Sandra, that's my wife. She'd have hunted me down in Tibet. 
It was easy to come home facing music. Yeah, well, about Louise, uh, you know any reason why she might commit suicide? Frankly, no. No. I met her in the hallway tonight, and she said, Mr. Singleby, she said, Ben didn't do that hold up because I'm pretty sure I know who did. Well, I figure she's just keeping up a front, but if she did really know that Ben didn't do it, she wouldn't have turned on the gas now, would she? No, she wouldn't. Uh, did she tell you who she thought did it? No, that's all she said. She's a quiet girl. Not like my wife. Now, Sam. Yeah, uh, did you see or hear anything that might have been suspicious or unusual around her apartment tonight? Now, look, I don't want to go around breaking up any homes or spreading dirty gossip around. Unless it involves Sandra's relatives. Uh, Mr. Singleby, I promise you, sir, that I'll treat any information you give me confidentially as long as I can. All right. Now, listen. Sandra told me not to say anything because, it's, you know, it's a lot easier to rent a suicide apartment than a murder apartment. You know that? Confidentially, I'm a humanitarian. But if you tell anybody I said this, I'll, well, I'll just lie about it. I'll never tell a soul. Well, we were out of butter, see, so I had to run down to the store. Well, when I passed the mailboxes outside, a guy is standing there. He asked me which apartment Louis Mil- uh, Louise Miller was in, and I said 12B. What did he look like? Oh, let's see now. A uh, 5'10", medium build, pan suit, dark shirt, sort of a uh, wide brim hat, kind of flashy. Mm-hmm. Wore three or four big rings, diamonds they looked like. Three yeah. or four big diamond rings on each hand. The ice man. Why didn't you tell all this to the police? Bert! Bert, who are you talking to? Don't you dare say a word about that poor girl. That's why. That is why. Sandra always says, keep your mouth shut and you keep out of trouble. But me, I don't know. I just love... Bert, stop talking too much and close that door. Yes, Sandra, dear. I'm closing it. The Iceman. I'd heard about him for years. A Chicago import, but I'd never bumped into him before. He'd been headquartering at the Red Spot Cafe, the uh, kind of a place that Skid Row winos visit when they want to slum. It was dark inside, but I strolled manfully to the bar. Yeah, something? The ice man here? What do you want him for, huh? He's a friend of mine. You're a friend of who's? What are you giving me? You got bull written all over you from the top of your stupid head to the bottom of your flat feet. He had the tan suit, the flashy rings, the dark shirt, and the wide-brimmed hat. He stared at me with eyes that were icy and insolent. He rubbed the knuckles of one hand into the palm of the other as if he just ached for a chance to bruise them, which I was sure he did. Four guys sauntered over to lean on the piano, and as ugly as they were, I knew it wasn't a barbershop quartet. Two more left the bar and stood behind him, and a few others got up from nearby tables and joined the group. I should have brought my team, but I hadn't. You're a friend of mine, huh? Well, if it isn't Claude Bettering, the juvenile delinquent of 1940. Is that so? Now, you're a real brain. Who are you, brainy? Sam Spade. Oh, now, ain't that a pretty name? You got something on your mind? I just wanted to talk with you about what you did to a girl named Louise Miller tonight. Never heard of her. Sounds cute, though. Girls are a lot easier to push around, aren't they, Claude? Call me Ice. Claude? <laughs> some guys are just as easy as some things. Where have I been all night tonight, fellas? Yeah, right. You heard that, Spade? I've been here all night. Any of you guys ever hear of a Louise Miller? No. Uh... Yeah, sorry, nobody ever heard of her, see? Well, she has a lot of friends who have. The police, the people down at Mercy Hospital, and me. And uh, none of us are going to forget her. Or uh, what happened to her. And who did it. Got something you'd like to do right now, maybe? Yeah. But I'll pick my time. All right. Enough of this cheap chatter. I don't want to be seen talking with you too long. I got my reputation to think about. Now blow before I take one hand out of my pocket and push your stinking face back through that door. You'll need both hands, Samson. <laughs> Go on, you creep. Fellas. All right. As I went rapidly through the door, Claude Bettering was standing, oily smile and all, polishing a couple of his oversized rings on his lapel. It was a picture I said I wouldn't forget, and I didn't. I went and rented myself a car, parked it down the block from the Red Spot Cafe, and waited almost all night. I knew that Louise Miller was not the kind of a girl who would have anything to do with a guy like Bettering. And if he came to her apartment, this must have been for some unloving purpose. Probably to keep her from telling who actually did the holdup Ben Comiskey had confessed to, if she found out the truth. Finally, a bunch of palookas came out, Bettering included, climbed into a car and drove off, me after them. One by one, Bettering dropped his men off at their hotels and apartments until he was finally alone. He uh, stopped at a brownstone on Hobart, and I caught him just as he opened the door of his apartment. Well, the tough guy. You're going to find out. Don't think I'm easy. (laughs) 
And he wasn't easy. He was three inches shorter and 25 pounds lighter, and wherever he had picked up his reputation for toughness, he earned it. But I never enjoyed a fight in my life any more than that one. I battered him to his maze and into the floor, and he still wouldn't give up. You stinking creep. Why did you beat up Louise Miller? I didn't. Why? I didn't. Why? I didn't. Why? I... Your poppin' house manager identifies you. He's a liar. What did you do it for? Nobody. Who? Nobody. Who? You stinking creep. I'll bless your face. Who? Who? Bless your face. He went out. Quite a guy, the Iceman. I used his phone to call the police and tell them to pick him up for attempted murder. Then with dawn coming up and my energy going down, I went back to the city jail, got a pass, and woke up Ben Comiskey. Why don't you stop messing around in my business, Steve? Did you ever really love that girl of yours? Get out, you sadistic jerk. Well, she's in Mercy Hospital now. You can send her a card. Write something nasty on it. So long. Steve. Yeah? What? What's she in the hospital about? What do you care? Tell me, please. Somebody turned on the gas in her apartment and tried to kill her. It's nothing, really. Please. Who did it? Who did it, Steve? I think it was a guy named Claude Bettering. They call him the Ice Man in certain circles. But why? That's what I'd like to know. Who's Bettering? I don't know. Your girl believed you were innocent, Kaminsky, but you said you weren't. My guess is that somebody figured she knew something and tried to shut her up. I think uh, Bettering was hired by somebody. Spade, look, I, I don't have any dough, see? But I want to get out of here for one day. If you know anybody to raise the bail, I, I won't skip. And I'll pay back anything you want. Why? I got to see somebody. I don't think I can. Who do you want to see? My lousy, dirty, low-down, no-good brother. He hired Bettering? Who else? He did everything. He'd always done everything wrong. He held up that liquor store, but he's on parole, a two-time felony offender. One more rap and he'd go up for 20 years. I did this for him. Yeah, look at me. I did it for him, and he tries to kill my girl. Your mother said he was a good boy, hardworking, lived in Cincinnati. Me again. I told her all that. She believed it. I started the whole stupid lie and had to go through with it. I could explain two years, three years to her, but not 20. He promised he'd go straight. He promised I see. I even sent him money I earned and said it was from him. Oh, you never saw anybody like me before, did you? No, I haven't. Get me out. Get me out, Sam, and I'll drag him in by his back teeth. Thanks anyway, but I'll do it myself. Hey, let me do it. Let me do it, please. I drove over to Mrs. Kaminsky's house and knocked on her door. She came out in a house coat, hair mussed, and sleep still in her eyes. Yes? I'm, uh... Sorry to bother you at this hour, Mrs. Kaminsky, but is your son home, Jimmy? Jim? No, he went, he went out last night. He didn't come back yet. I see. Uh, when are you expecting? Well, he, he didn't see. He didn't have to because I saw a closet door move and I was in and across the room. In a second, I pulled the door back and Jim Kaminsky came out, gun and all. Jim! 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 She hurried across the room, threw herself between Jimmy and me, and started wrestling the gun away from her. She put one hand flat on her face and knocked her halfway across the room. I went at him. He shot, but it went into the ceiling. I didn't give him a chance to do it again. You held up the liquor store, didn't you? Yeah. And hired Bettering to kill Louise Miller? Yeah. And you're going to take your own rap from now on? Yeah. Yeah, I will. Report. Oh, that poor old lady. Yeah. Yeah, she lived in a dream world built by a son who had too much heart and not enough common sense. But Sam, that, that man in the liquor store identified Ben as a hookup man. Well, when he saw the both brothers together, we realized he'd made a mistake. At night, with a hat pulled down and a collar up, anybody could have confused the Comiskey brothers. Sam, why is the world so cruel? Because people live on it. Now go on and type it out, huh? Well, here it is, Sam. And if you don't mind my saying so, it's a lesson to everybody. If you say so, Ed. Oh, no, Sam, I'm just infuriated. No, no, don't go too far. This place loves devotion. Just this is right. Now, hand me the glass. Well, this kind of thing could be going on all over the world. 
glass up. If it were for people like you who step in and take things in hand. Thank you, I said. Thank you, Miss Brain. Honestly, Sam, well, honestly, that's all. Are you finished? Well, I, well, just, uh, I have some sociological feelings, too. I'm just not an auto man or secretary. You turn on and off. With... Come here. Come here. With each new case, I have feelings. Effie, I just kissed you. I know what... I just kissed you. Oh, Sam. Delayed reaction. Must be the heat. Oh, good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. Oh, no, Nicky, darling, that's not it. It isn't, Nora? No, it goes like this. Thirty-three fine brews blended into one great beer. <laughs> Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer presents The New Adventures of the Thin Man with Nick and Nora Charles, the happiest, merriest married couple in radio. Tonight and every Tuesday night at this same time, that international favorite Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer proudly presents the finest in summertime entertainment. So, sit back, relax, and pour yourself a tall, foaming glass full of blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. While you listen to the stars of our show, Claudia Morgan as Nora and Les Tremaine as Nick, in tonight's adventure of The Thin Man entitled The Haunted Hams. <laughs> Every once in a while, a man's wife gets the idea that her husband needs a change. Of course, the conscientious little homemaker never suggests that her husband change his wife. Well, this evening, we find the great ex-detective, Nick Charles, in a car with his lovely wife, Nora, and his good friend, Ebenezer Williams, driving through the countryside. Nicky, look at that moon come up over those trees. Can you see anything as beautiful as that in the city? Yes. Oh, name it. The moon over the polo grounds as the Giants and the Dodgers play a night game. That just shows how badly you needed this change, doesn't it, Ed? Yes, I reckon so. You've been working too hard, Nick. Me? Working? Yes. You've got to get your nose out of that grindstone. Ed, you, my partner, can say a thing like that? Yeah. I got to get my nose out of the grindstone, too. That grindstone's becoming crowded with noses. Nora, the only thing we've had our noses in were comic books and detective stories. That's right. Detective stories, comical books, comical books, detective stories. We was in a rut. And you think we'll get out of it by going up to your farm, Ed? Why, of course. It's about time we changed ruts. <laughs> Ev. Huh? Ev, listen, there's a fire engine coming up behind you. Oh, bit of bull. Uh, I used to be a volunteer fireman around here in the days when I was sheriff. Here comes the engine, Ed. Yeah. Say, that's my old friend Newt, the fire chief. Ev, he's stopping. Yeah. Howdy, Newt. Howdy, Ev. I thought that was you driving the car, and I stopped just to make sure. That's you, all right. There can't nobody else. Well, I'm awful glad to see you back, Ev. Well, I'm glad to be back, Newt. Oh, this is my friends, Nick and Nori Charles. Howdy, folks. It's nice to know you. Are you going to or coming from a fire, Mr. Newton? Uh, going to, of course. Say, Eb, did you hear that Shad Simmons had a calf with two heads last April? Well, what do you know? Yes, but even with two heads, he ain't no smarter than one with one. Is this a serious fire you're going to, Newt? Well, I can't tell I get there, my friend. Say, Eb, uh, did you hear about Methuselah Marbrain? Don't tell me that he finally married Belle May Bogardis. Well, they set the wedding for September, but they postponed it. Again? Yeah. Oh, dear. After him being engaged to her for 15 years? Well, they had a good reason. They figured they'd wait till they was better acquainted. They didn't want to be hasty. No. Marry in haste, repent. And lose uh, yes. Whose fire are you going to, Newt? Well, I'm awful glad you remind me of that, Eb. Now, Silas Salem's, he's got a fire tonight. Uh, would you like to come along and help? Well, yes, I reckon so. Well, uh, just let me get there first. That's all I request. It makes a better impression on the taxpayers. Well, it was a 
Pleasant chat, Em. I'll see you at the fire. Yeah. I hope you fellas want to put it out before we get there, Newt. Oh, have no fear, Em. We'll wait for you. All aboard, boys. Let our roar. <laughs> Does he always dash to a blaze like that, eh? No. <laughs> well, he ain't exactly speedy, but we elected him because he was the only one that can play the tubi in the fireman's band. Look, Nick, here's the fire. Yes, and it ain't Silas's house burning tall. It's just his old barn. Well, come on, Ed. Maybe we can rescue some of his livestock. Hurry up, Nora. I am, Nick, but you needn't be so anxious. Oh, well, now, don't ruin my fun, baby. Ever since I retired from being a detective, I've been dying to rescue something, even if it's a cow. Hi, Ed. Oh, hi there, Ed. Uh, howdy, folks. How's she burning, Newt? Well, burning pretty good for a barn, Eb. Have you got all the animals out of the barn yet? Oh, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. <laughs> Had some awful queer-looking animals in there, though. What kind? Well, what you might call the shitty kind. Dog? Well, that depends on your point of view. I heard them saying they've been treated like dogs. Oh, well, they're people. That depends on your point of view, too. <laughs> they're actors. Uh, real honest, goodness, live actors. Where's Silas? Oh, he went back to farmhouse. He said he's got the barn insured, so there ain't nothing to worry about. He's been stabling them live actors because he says they're some kind of summer stock. Oh, you mean they're a summer stock company. Where is that fire chief? Where is he hiding? That must be he over there, master. Uh, looking for me, Bob? I certainly am. I am the director and producer of this company. I am Greg Noisky. Well, I'm Newton Newton. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Uh, 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 what'd you say your first name was? You couldn't pronounce it. Just call me Greg Noisky. Listen, our teeth are burning. Our I'm going very to... glad to meet you, Mr. G. This is my friend, Ed Williams. Hey, Mr. Mr. G. G. Hello, Master Fire Chief. Aren't Mr. you going to... Mr. G, I'd like you to meet my friends here, Nick and Nori Charles. How do you do? I'm doing terrible, thank you. Please, about that fire. Ain't you going to introduce us to your lady friend, Mr. G? This is Myra Mannix, our ingenue. Now, please, Pleased to meet you, Miss Mannix. Cheers, greetings, salutations, and all that sort of rot. Oh, are you British? No, but we're putting on a jolly old British play, you know. Mr. Newton, old boy, aren't you going to do something about our theater? It's getting a bit overheated, you know. Oh, uh, what theater? The barn. We made it into a theater. It's burning. Aren't you going to do anything about that fire? Well, we're watching it, ain't we? Watching it? You're supposed to put it out! He's kind of excitable, ain't he, Eb? Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, theatrical people, they got more nerves and voices than any other kind, you know. Well, yeah. the barn will burn to the ground! Don't you want to put it out? Why, of course not. Some of my boys might get hurt in a blaze like that. Besides, you can't put it out. Why not? Nature, my boy, nature. Too much fire and not enough water. But it sure looks awful pretty, don't it? Look at it. Pretty? I'm going wicky. What, 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 what? Well, what? excuse me, folks. I'd better see to my boys. They're getting awful close to that fire. Don't you think so, Eb? Yes, they might get a blister. Oh, dear. Say, now, look, Eb, you stay here for a little while. You can see none of them act of people interferes with the blaze. And if it begins to spread, you call me. Yeah, sure. You going back to town, Newt? Oh, yes, I think I should. There might be some other fires for us to look at. Oh, Nick, he's leaving. Yes. Well, they sure look dashing in those firemen's uniforms. So, Ed, how does the siren sound? Great, great, new. Sounds just like an opera star. Oh, that's good. It's a brand new one. Well, give her the gun, Willis. Well, Nick and Nori, that barn's practically burned to the ground now, so I reckon we can go. All right, Ed. But I wonder what poor Mr. Gnoisky and his actors are going to do without a theater. Ed, you have a nice big barn on your farm, haven't you? Yes, Ed, but don't say it's so loud. Oh, it's too late. Here comes Gret Noisky and his ingenue, and they've got an opening night gleam in their eyes. Don't depart, Mr. Williams. Wait a moment. Yeah, chums, we got great plans for you. <laughs> Silas Salem says you got a nice large barn. You great, big, mature Gary Cooper man, you. Oh, I'm only human. <laughs> and such character in his face, like a ripe Gregory Peck. Where do you keep your barn, and how much do you want for it? Well, I don't know, folks. I, no, I, I wouldn't consider renting it. Not unless my business partner here says I should. Oh? Ah, oh, Nicky Wicky. 
Did anybody ever tell you you're gorgeous? Yes, my wife. Well, that doesn't count. With me, it does. I can't make up my mind without her advice. Nora. Grignoyski. You adore her. But, but, but I do. Would you like to be worshipped? I can make your star overnight. Uh, well, I'm afraid we're not interested. You see, we came up here to get away from all the excitement and insanity of the city. Madame, wouldn't you like to be a great star? Uh, well, every woman would like to be a great actress, but uh, I'm different. Well, if you won't help us, won't you at least listen to our tale of woe? Tell me, have you ever heard of Floyd Fresne? Fresne? Hasn't he something to do with the movie? Why, yes, Nick. He's some sort of big-time agent. He is a movie mogul, and he is backing this company. We are supposed to develop new movie stars, and when he finds out that we have no bond, oh, Myra, we pay them to show them how unhappy we are. You mean no theater, no chance at Hollywood. That's right, Nora. Of course, I despise the coast and the cinema with its pots of gold and lack of artistic standards. But if Floyd Presnay signed you up to go out there... I'd gladly murder my dear grandma to get there. Now, do you understand? We expect to see Floyd Presnay any minute. He was going to come by for a dress rehearsal. Hey, look, Grignoski. Isn't that Mr. Presnay's car now? Yes. My think of some brilliant excuse for this catastrophe. Oh, shall I tell him that we worked with an ardor so burning that the barn caught fire? Hello there, FF. Greetings, Gladnoisky. I have a wonderful explanation why the barn burned down. You've heard of the Chicago fire, no doubt? Heard of it. I saw it. In Technicolor. Colossal. Well, the same thing happened to us. Who would dream that there is a distant relative to Mrs. O'Leary's car? Just a moment. No improvising. Everybody quiet. Who is she? Nora Charles. Come here, child. Uh, Me? Yes. Bare your teeth. There. Do they bite? You want to find out? Uh, No. Then get your hands off my face. Uh, 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 I'm just feeling the bony structure. Hey, what do you think you're doing? Who is he? Her husband. Get rid of him? Listen, Fresnay, who do you think you are? Uh, Tell me, my man. Uh, Does your wife have a figure... As good as it looks. What? Well, you want to know, does she? I certainly have. Grudnoyski, this woman has the most photogenic face and figure I've seen in 20 years. She's a new garbo. I want to see her give a performance in two weeks. Two weeks, mind you. Find another barn. I'll pay all the bills. Adios. Uh, Adios, FF. Nora, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. Yeah, and you'll be able to give us all a break. Well, really, uh... Think of it, your name in life. Platinum swimming pools, sable underwear. Do you think I'm a foolish, silly girl like all the other girls in the world? Yes. You're patriotic, aren't you? I certainly am. Then think of this. Your income taxes alone will make the government rich. Uh, Mr. Grednoitsky, I'd love to help you and your friends, but if you think I ever had any ambitions to be an actress... Adored by the world, thrilling audiences, having my name and picture in the papers, just being too, too wonderful, you're absolutely right. Ev, how soon can we get the cattle out of your barn? You are listening to the new adventures of The Thin Man, presented for your summertime entertainment by the makers of that international favorite, Pamp's Blue Ribbon Beer. Say, Mr. Orchestra Leader, would you mind blowing that little pitch pipe of yours? Thank you. Now, again, please. And again. That's right. No matter how many times you sound that same note, it's always exactly alike. Just as every bottle, every glass, every taste of Pabst Blue Ribbon beer is always exactly alike, no matter where or when you buy it. The reason for that fresh, clean, sparkling taste, that perfect uniformity, goes back to the little tune Nicky was strumming on the piano at the beginning of this program. Thirty-three fine brews blended into one great beer. Just think, every glass, every drop of Pabst Blue Ribbon beer contains never less than 33 fine brews. So be sure there's plenty of blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon cooling in your refrigerator, ready to serve to those unexpected guests when they drop in on a summer evening. And now for Act Two of tonight's Thin Man Adventure... 
two weeks have passed since Nora was bitten by the acting bug. And we find her now studying her part in the play that the great Russian director, Gred Nursky, and his actors are going to put on in Ebb Williams' barn. But I do think you're terribly, irresistibly smushing, Lord Cornish Thimpleberry. A gay laugh. Uh, <clears throat> you think that last ha was a trifle phony, Nick? I think the whole thing's phony. Oh, well, you're just saying that because Gred Noisky only gave you a small part and I'm playing the lead. Nora, do you really want to become a movie star? Do you think I'd be acting this silly if I didn't? But, darling, despite Floyd Fresnay, you, you just can't be a star overnight. Gred Noisky thinks I can, and he knows much more about it than you do, dear. And don't talk to me this way. You, you get me out of the mood. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> oh, how's that? Sounds like a coloratura soprano gargling with Drano. Nicky, how dare you say a thing like that to me? We're opening tonight. Now, 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 Nora, don't get temperamental again. Well, I've got to be temperamental. Every star's temperamental. And I'm furious with you. Give me something to smash. Here, here, here. I collected some old glasses that Ebb doesn't need. He says they're good for smashing. Thank you. That's better. Now, <clears throat> but I do think you're terribly, irresistibly smushing, Lord Cornish, Dimple, very... <laughs> Gay laugh, oh dear. <laughs> Huh. Nicky, don't you want me to be a movie star? Well, darling, frankly, no. And why not? Why, I, I hardly ever see you anymore. Oh, naturally, my career, you know. But, baby, you dragged me up here to take care of me. I, I'm being neglected. You know what happens to neglected wives. Well, you're not a wife, you're a husband. Don't you know anything, Nicky? Well, you know what happens to neglected husbands. The same thing as happens to neglected wives. Oh, don't be silly, dear. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> Will you stop that laughing, please? Nicky, behave yourself or I'll get temperamental again. Now, listen, baby, I don't think you should go on with this. I knew it. You're jealous because I've got a career. Okay. I'm jealous. Well, darling, I let you have a career as a detective for years, and now you won't let me become a movie star. Is that fair? No, darling. Well, then why do you want me to give it up? Because, because... Don't you think I'm any good? Frankly? Frankly. Frankly, no. I said it, and I'm glad. Give me a glass, please, Nicky. Here, dear. Get rid of your disappointment. Hey, don't aim at my head. Nora, cut it out. I, I changed my mind. You're great. I knew you'd alter your opinion. Oh, uh, enter. I mean, I'm decent. Howdy, Nori. You're wanted on stage for rehearsal. And guess what? Mm -hmm. One of the actors just quit, and Mr. G, he gave me a part, too. I'm going to be Duke Lucifoot Grenadier. Mr. G thinks I got a lot of plain, common, ordinary nobility. Mr. G is a genius at discovering talent. Yeah. And Nick... If you think I'm no good, just watch what happens at this dress rehearsal. <clears throat> but I do think you're terribly, irresistibly smushing, Lord Cornish, a simple Betty. Gay laugh. <laughs> 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 All right, Nora, we will take the big jealousy scene between you and Myra. Now remember... Nikolaus is your latest flame who doesn't burn hot enough. And Ebenezer is your philosophical advisor who hates you and loves you both together. <laughs> who said that? Nobody, Mr. G. That's just one of my ducks. I wish I were sure of that. It sounded like someone was whispering Russian insults in a loud voice. <laughs> Hear that? I taught the duck to talk Russian. Well, that explains it. Come on, on with the scene. So... You dare enter my home, Penelope. Yes, Lady Chattelipo. To claim that which is rightfully me. A uh, mine. Duke Lucifer Grenadier, you have never given me bad advice. What shall I do, my dear Duke? Ebenezer, do you have a cold? No, no, that's just my cow peeking in the door. Oh, he would make a wonderful actor. Beautiful voice. Proceed. Throw the little scamp out in the gutter. From whence she rose, my dear, dear Lady Chattel Lathorpe. Lady Chattel Lathorpe. Yes, Colonel Biscay Rendango. I can bear it no longer. 
Won't you call me Rumpy Dumpy as you did when we romped in the castle together in our childhood? I will never call you Rumpy Dumpy again. That is all part of our hideous past, Colonel Miske Rendango. I deny that. To me, you will always be Princess Bunny Gunny, the golden-haired girl who taught me about life under the castle moat. Uh, what did you say, Gudnoisky? Nothing. It was the gold powder. Oh, that's funny. He sounded just like you. I have a more beautiful voice than that miserable goat. Oh, yeah, Mr. G. Let me tell you, that's one of the finest goats in Crabtree County. Uh, uh, I'll bet you can't make a noise as fine as that. I certainly can. The goat sounds better. Myra, are you turning against me too? Can I help it if the goat has a lovely vocal organ? Will you stop this? The curtain goes up in two hours, and I'm forced to talk to Nanny Goat. <laughs> Sarah! Speak! <clears throat> Lady Chattel Le you are cruel beyond words. And I don't care what happens to me, even if I pay for this with my life. So there. Oh! No, no, no. That's no way to scream when you're shot. But I was trying to do it with a British accent. Hi, Gretnoisky. We'll show you how to make screams with an English accent. Like this. Ah! You see? You must scream like a lady. Ah! Ah! No! Ah! Oh! Ah! Oh! Ah! Oh! No! We pass him! <laughs> That's better. That, that was the rooster! Oh, you, you... You think I'm terrible, don't you? You think I can't act as well as, as, as that rooster? I, I didn't say that. Well, you, you're not much better than that nanny goat. Why do you let those animals come in here and upset me up? I, I hate you all. Nora, Nora, darling, come back here. <laughs> Don't have to do yourself. I'll eat you someday. Nora, darling, let me into your dressing room. Please, baby. I've got to talk to you. Nikki, hasn't she come out of there yet? No, Myra. I've been trying to get in ever since she ran out of the dress rehearsal, but she won't open the door. When's the curtain? In just a few minutes, and the people are coming in now. Floyd Fresnay is out there. Throw the little scamp out into the gutter from whence she rose, dear. Dear lady, chattel the thought. Business. Hi, Nick. How's Nori? She still won't talk to me. Eb, if she won't let me see her, I won't be able to go on either. Well, me too. I can't go on with these nervous upsets. How can they expect me to give a performance? You've got nerves, too? Yes, I have. I never had them till I become an actor, though. Oh, how can she face those people with no confidence in herself? And I helped destroy her confidence. Nora. Nora, darling, open the door. Hey, look, she's turning the handle. The door is opening. Good evening, fellow players. If you wish to see me, enter. Nora, darling. I just want you to know, Nicholas, that despite your cruel and heartless discouragement, I shall give a performance that will make people's hair stand up. And no one will ever know that I'll be acting with an aching, breaking heart. You will, Nora? I will, Ebenezer. Oh, gee, you're a great trooper, Nora. Thank you, my little dear. And Nicky, sit on that chair. Okay, but why? So that I can get on your lap. Like this. Myra, what's the idea? Yes, this is indeed unusual behavior, even for an ingenue. I'm doing it so that he can spank me easier. Nora, it was I who ruined all your rehearsals. I put food near the theater to make the animals come in the barn. I did it to ruin your career. Oh, professional jealousy. And I greased the outside of your dressing room hoping that you'd break your leg. Oh, I've been awful. Because I studied your part and I wanted to play it and go to Hollywood and live in a mink lined swimming pool. Now spank me, Nicky. It will be a pleasure. Ah, thank you. You don't have to enjoy it that much, Nick. Two minutes and the curtain goes up, Nori. The house is sold out. Good luck. Well, Nori, we all want you to go out there and show them people what you can do. Uh, the, there are people out there? Real, live people? Hundreds of them. Oh. Oh, Nick, catch me. I think I'm dying. Well, Nora, I'm encumbered. I got it. Oh, oh, thank you, Eb. Myra. Myra, thank heavens you told me you know my part. For heaven's sake, go out there and play it. What? My dear child, I am going to sacrifice my career for yours. Anyone who wants to live in a mink-blind swimming pool as much as you do, deserves to. Yippee! 
me. Give me your costumes, Nora. I gotta change. I'll send you a free autograph from Hollywood. Oh! What happened, Myra? Did you break your little neck? No, I slipped on the grease I put there to break your leg. Nora, darling, I think this is wonderful of you. What made you do it? I'll tell you after the show, but... Uh, <clears throat> that's all part of our hideous past, Colonel Biscay Rendango. <laughs> Well, I can just imagine Nora telling Nick all about it after the show over a sparkling glass of Pabst Blue Ribbon, the beer that's blended from never less than 33 fine brews. There's nothing quite so refreshing on a hot summer night as a cold bottle of Pabst Blue Ribbon and a bowl of salty pretzels or a plate of crackers spread with some nippy cheddar cheese. You know, not only Nicky and Nora, but many stars of the radio, the stage, and movies enjoy Pabst Blue Ribbon beer in their homes. For instance, Gregory Peck, after a busy day on the studio set, likes to head for his icebox and a tall, foaming glass of Pabst Blue Ribbon. Wherever you go, from Hollywood to Honolulu, from Philadelphia to the Philippines, this famous beer is an international favorite. The beer that gives you 33 fine brews in every glass, every time. Taste it. Compare it. See why millions have settled down to blended, splendid Paps Blue Ribbon beer. And now for the conclusion of tonight's Thin Man Adventure. Myra was wonderful as Lady Chattel to Thorpe. Didn't you think so, Nicky? Mm-hmm. I'm glad she got that contract from Floyd Presnay. She really played that part much better than I could have. Oh, no, I wouldn't say that, baby. You would have been great in it. You didn't think so this afternoon. I think so now, dear. Oh, yes, when it's safe. Well, Nora, I must confess, what worried me this afternoon was that you might have become a great star and you'd never have time to bother me or drive me crazy. You really mean that, Nicky? <laughs> yes, Nora. Well, that's why I gave up my career, darling. I think you're much sweeter than a mink-lined swimming pool. Why, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Nicky. Yes, dear. Oh! Nora, what's the matter? What's wrong? I just wanted to show you I could do that scream properly. Oh! Why? You see? <laughs> That's oh. wonderful, Nora. The world lost another Helen Hayes in you. I know it, my dear. I know it. But it's no more than any wife can do. You mean... Every wife is a great actress? She has to be, darling. And no professional acting in front of an audience could even touch the performances the average wife puts on for her husband. You've got something there, dear. Uh, by the way, uh, how'd you like me tonight? Frankly, dear. Uh, frankly? Frankly, you're a great detective. Oh, yeah? Well, I'll have you know that Floyd Presnay was deeply touched by my interpretation of the role of Colonel Biscay Rendango. Touched where? In the head? He wants me to go to Hollywood. What are they looking for? A new Boris Collar? <laughs> you don't seem to realize what a talented man you're married to. Oh, yes, I do, Nick. Uh, are you going to take the offer? No, baby. I'm giving up acting for the same reason you did. You're lovelier than sable underwear. Why, thank you, Nicky. You know, dear, I don't think Lunt and Fontaine can throw as beautiful baloney to each other as we do. <laughs> Here's your Oscar. Hmm. Good night, Nikki, darling. Be sure to listen next Tuesday night when Pam's Blue Ribbon Beer brings you another happy, merry, thin man adventure starring Les Tremaine and Claudia Morgan. Next week, the adventure of the multiple marriage, where Nick and Nora acquire a daughter and discover that it's easier to stay married than to marry someone else. The Adventures of the Thin Man is brought to you by the Pamps Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Newark, New Jersey, and Peoria, Illinois. And this is Ed Hurley saying good night with the best wishes of Pamps Blue Ribbon dealers from coast to coast. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sam Spade, detective, I think you... Is I, sweetheart? Sam! 
Oh, it was great right to death. Just office. Glass all over the floor. Holes in the wall. That was just business going on as usual during all vacations, Eph. Well, what was it all about, Dad? They tried, Effie. Just tried to pluck my feathers and cook my goose. I'm so silly, too. How could they? Oh, they were a mean lot. Are you all right? Hale and hearty. Every giblet in place and not a feather ruffled. Did you have a nice Thanksgiving? Oh, it was heavenly. Mama had a turkey dinner, sage dressing, cranberry sauce, candy jars. Hard sighting? <laughs> a little. Calm, clean, Effie. Well, I, I, I had two glasses. Ah. Everyone was there. Cousin Gertie, Dwight, Mrs. Sloss. I was disappointed when you didn't show up, Sam. Did you have Thanksgiving dinner? Sure. Sam? At the Helping Hand Rescue Mission, where there's plenty of free parking and never a cover charge. For further details, consult the report, which I will presently be down to dictate on a pasty chronicle of foul play. The Terrified Turkey Caper. For NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Sam Oh, you were waiting for me. Having Thanksgiving dinner at a, at a rescue mission, and Mama cooked a perfectly wonderful... Ask your mother for me, and tell her I'll be over to break wishbones with her tonight. And to atone for my social indifferences, here's a little something I brought for you. Oh, Sam! Oh. You shouldn't have. It's beautiful. What is it? A blunder bus. A blunder what? Bus. As in step to the rear of. Oh. Well, what does it do? Shoot, Seth. It's a gun. Our founding fathers used it in foraging for feathered food when they settled this abundant continent. And it's mine. To do with what you will. Oh, where's the gun? Pencil boy? Yes, sir. Who gave it to you? Hat open? Oh, yes, but I don't know. Knees crossed? Did you mean the founding fathers? Don't peek. Date, November 24th, 1952. Detective Lieutenant I.C. Kelsey, Homicide Detail, San Francisco Police. From Samuel State, license number 137596. Subject, Turkey. Dear Kelsey... This was a big week for the cranberry pickers, the butchers, the sage makers, and the stomach pill people. But for private detectives, it was strictly from hunger. My office door opened only twice a day. Once to let me in and once to let me out. And when on Wednesday I heard a knock on the door, I went into a paroxysm of delight. Come in! Come in! Come in! Andre Vu! Andre is dead! Erlein! When I ran out of languages, I got up from behind the desk, walked to the door, and opened it. Standing there was a small, middle-aged man with a pink, bald head. His blue serge suit needed pressing, and he was nervously fingering a strawberry birthmark under his left ear. Uh, Mr. Samuel Spade? I am. May, may I? May I have a moment? You me? may have several, but not in the corridor. It's not in my lease. Oh, I'll come in. Good, good, good. Well... Uh, you'll have to excuse me, Mr. Spade. I, I've had so few dealings with private detectives. I, I find it hard to begin. Well, I... Oh, perhaps I shouldn't have come at all. Goodbye. No, 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 wait a minute. Maybe I can help you. Well, oh, you see, I... I... Oh, what's the use? You won't believe me. Nobody does. I'd really better... Oh, now, wait. Wait. I'll believe you. All I ask is a chance. Now, now let's start with your name. Oh, what, my name? Yes. Yes. Yes, my name. To begin with, you won't believe that. Oh. Oh, but I can verify it. Yes, I can. It's on this registration book of the old Colony Hotel in the 1943 phone book and on my old driver's license. Well, I'll have to know it before I can verify it. Oh, yes, yes, of course you will. It's, uh, it's Tom. Well, now that's not so hard to believe. Oh, you haven't heard the rest of it. It's Tom. Apparently. <clears throat> Well, you, you see, I told you you wouldn't believe it. I'd better go. Oh, no, uh, let me be the first to believe you. Now, Mr. Uh, uh, Tom, uh, what's your problem? Oh, dear. Dear, that's even harder to explain. Well, now that I don't believe. But uh, take a breath and jump into it. Yes, yes. My name is Tom Turkey, and they're going to kill me for Thanksgiving. <laughs> Well, I had asked for it, and I had gotten it. And I sat back wondering who had gone to all the trouble to play this funny joke on me. I was looking at my hand to see if there was any itching powder on it where he'd shaken it when my phone rang. 
I lifted the receiver, swung around in my swivel, and gazed out onto the street. It was Al Kuchel calling, a private eye whose reputation was shadier than a mushroom seller. Hi, Spady. Al. Haven't seen much of you lately, Spady. Now have to get together. Yeah, well, so long. Wait, wait, I'll tell you why I called. I've had a pest in my office, keeps coming back. Thinks he's a turkey, somebody wants to dress. I brushed him, but your name came up, and I just wanted to warn you. He might be in to see you. I'm confused, Al. I never knew you to turn your back on a buck. Oh, I don't want any of this one. His buttons are loose. My advice to you is to bounce him. Well, we've never traded advice before, Coochie. Why now? Well, after all, we're in the same racket. If we can't help each other... Oh, sure, Al, sure. I appreciate it. Give me a ring. We've got to get together sometime. Yeah, when I get a free night, we'll Jimmy parking meter. Yeah, we... Huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Parking meters. I'll see you later, Spady. I turned back to the desk, and what I saw in front of me was an empty chair. Tom Turkey had taken wing. I got up and walked to the window, and a minute later, I saw him come out of the building downstairs and start to cross the street. And then I saw something else. The large four-ton truck was tearing down the street, picking up speed. Instinctively, I shouted a warning. And at the last second, Tom Turkey scrambled from in front of the truck and disappeared into the alleyway. A truck roared up the street, and on its side was printed in gold letters, Pain, you drive it. There was nothing to say it wasn't coincidence, this near miss mishap. But somehow I found myself intrigued and wanting to hear more of the little guy's story. He said the old Colony Hotel... On the way, I stopped at the library, found an old 1943 phone book, and looked. He was listed. Thomas Turkey, it said. Out of curiosity, I rang the number. Hello? I wonder if you can help me. I'm inquiring about a Mr. Turkey. Turkey? This ain't his number no more. I know. I haven't had any calls from him for years. Call him out. Yeah, I know, I know. I know a woman named Robert once. Mrs. Robert. About Turkey. Could you remember what he looked like? I don't. Hey, Manny, what Turkey looked like? Huh? Oh. Uh-huh. 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 Yeah, yeah. Small man, round 50. Nice fellow, man, he says. Strawberry under his left ear? Strawberry under his left ear, Manny. Uh-huh. Yeah, strawberry under his left ear. Well, thank you, madam, for your information, and thanks to Manny. Well, you're welcome, but I don't know what you're going to do with it. Old man Turkey's dead. Been dead for years. <laughs> Curiouser and curiouser, I thought. They had described the man who came to my office 20 minutes ago. And now he'd been dead for years. I continued on to the old colony hotel. Room, 75 cents, it said. Tom's room was 114. Who is it? Sam Spade. Oh, come in, Mr. Spade. Hmm. I'm, I'm sorry I ran away. I didn't think you really believed me. Well, I'm not sure I do yet. Tell me, was that truck an accident? Oh, I don't think so, no. They, they made three attempts before to kill me. Somebody tried to push me in front of a train, and then a wheelchair full of cement dropped off a building and just missed me, and then I was shot at. Oh, who were they, and why would they want to kill you? I don't know. I just don't know. Look, let's pack. Pack? Pack. I dialed your old phone number, and the people who answered said you're dead. Oh, a lot of people think I'm dead. Yeah. Look, do you still want me to work for you? Oh, yes, yes, please. Well, you'll have to tell me more, then. I yes, can't... I... I guess I'd better tell you everything. Oh, it's, it's hard to talk about, Mr. Spade. It's not easy to admit to someone you've been a foolish man. You see, I just turned 50. I was quite tired of the life I'd led. Proper, dull, and unfruitful, except in mine. My business was wearing, and so was my wife, Henry. This has a traditional ring. Anyway, to make it short, I decided to run away. One day I drove to work, I parked my car in the middle of the Bay Bridge where the suicide note left it and disappeared. Where did you go? Oh, all over the world. I took a job on a boat. I did. On a boat. And then I settled in San Paulo, Brazil, under another name. Now you're back. Why? Maybe I got lonely. Maybe I got wiser. Maybe maybe I felt I paid enough for my mistakes. Let's just say I'm back. I want to be with Henrietta. Have you seen her? I checked into this hotel and wrote her a letter saying I wasn't dead. I was back in San Francisco and I... I wanted to come back to her if she still would have me. But I told her I wouldn't bother her unless she wanted to see me. That she could contact me here. That was a week ago. And you haven't heard from her? No, no. And almost right away, these attempts on my life began. I see. All right, what's her address? 3118 Monroe. Oh, she's taken her maiden name again. Black. Henrietta Black. Well, come on, let's go. No, no, I'm not going to see her until she asks me. Well, look, you're going to my apartment. Nobody will bother you there. And you're going to see Henriette? That's right. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spade. You, you do believe me. I 
think I'm really ready to face the world again now. I deposited Tom in my apartment with instructions to open the door for no one but me. And then I proceeded to 3118 Monroe in a high rent district. I was ushered through a comely portico by a Japanese maid who told me to wait in a study heavy with mahogany. In a moment, two people came in. The woman wore a black dress, silver pendant, flat shoes, and a complexion the color of apple meat. She was Miss Henrietta Black and or Mrs. Tom Turkey. The man turned out to be Leander Luce, the lady's attorney, business manager, and canasta partner. You say you have something important to discuss with me, Mr. Stone? I do. I hope you don't mind my asking Mr. Luce to be here. Not at all. Uh-huh. Mrs. Turkey, I just talked to your husband, Tom. Mr. Spade, if you please. I say something? A rather feeble attempt at comedy, Mr. Spade. Well, I wasn't trying for a laugh. You are Mrs. Turkey, aren't you? I was. You undoubtedly still are. I've expected to hear another one of these cruel jokes about my name. At Thanksgiving time, Mr. Spade, someone was always going to stuff Tom, base him, dress him, slice him. This season, they're going to kill him. They are not going to kill him. He is already dead. He's not dead, Mrs. Turkey. And you should not. I should. Yes, he sent you a letter saying he was back in San Francisco and wanted to see you. Mr. Spade, this has gone absolutely far enough. Not quite. What about the letter? I know of no such letter. I see. Well, thank you for your time. I'm sorry I bothered you. Oh, you used bad judgment in coming in the first place. Yes, maybe you're wrong. There was falsehood in this someplace, Lieutenant, and it stuck out like a fat girl in slacks. The only thing to do was to go back to my apartment, get Tom Turkey, and confront Mrs. T with her husband in the flesh. But when I got back to my apartment building, I spotted in rapid succession, one, an ambulance, two, a police car, and upstairs, outside my half-open apartment door, I spotted three, you. I've been expecting it. What's going on, Kelsey? Yeah, serious, Sam, serious. Who's that bald-headed man moving around the apartment? That's McCracken, the new medical examiner, checking a stiff on your rug. <laughs> I stepped around you, Lieutenant, and pushed the door all the way open. I saw McCracken kneeling over the body and a couple of men from Homicide taking photos. I moved into the room feeling nothing good. A little guy had given me a job, and while I was jacking with his wife, somebody got to him. And in my apartment, where I'd stashed him, McCracken stood up and I looked down at the body. Then I looked again. Who I saw wasn't Tom Turkey at all. It was the late private eye, Al Kuchel. <laughs> Listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Fade. You Friday fans of Sam Spade, there's mystery on Saturday evening, too, on NBC. Tomorrow, the man called X sets out on another mission of danger and intrigue in some far-off corner of the earth. Herbert Marshall stars as the man called X, a man without a name who travels the world over, protecting his country's interests. He lives by his wits, and his business is danger. He's the man called X, tomorrow over most NBC stations. For Top Sunday Listening, it's another broadcast of The Big Show on NBC. This Sunday, your stars include Fred Allen, Jack Carson, Mindy Carson, Ed Archie Gardner, Ed Wynn, and many, many more. And Tallulah is your MC as usual. This Sunday, it's The Big Show on NBC. And now, back to the terrified turkey caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. While the men from Homicide were taking pictures, etc., you and I, Lieutenant, were going round and round on the question, if I didn't kill the man found in my room, who did? And you were sufficiently impressed with my insult, Chelsea, not to hold me for the murder. We bowed to each other, and I left. Thinking back to the truck that had almost run Turkey down, I went to the Haynes U Drive truck rental garage. Yeah. What is Hey, what do you want? I'm a detective. Could you give me a list of names for everybody who rented a truck from you during the past few days? Sure. He handed me a big registration book, and I read every name for the past week. For the first five days, they all seemed to be nice, normal, abnormal names. And then, under the rentals for the day before, was the name of John Smith. John had given his address to 7200 Churney. And I happen to know that Churney only goes up to 2000. 
The dispatcher said that Smith had returned the truck about three hours before. And he remembered him as an ugly, heavy-set, and rough-voiced character who looked like an ex-longshoreman. They had already washed the truck, so the fingerprints were all out of Mr. Spade again. Look, I'd like to speak with Mrs. Turk, uh, Miss Black, if you don't mind. Come in. Come in. Thank you. This way, into the den. Right. Well, I was sure you'd look into this affair a little more and realize that it was just a blind alley. A hoax of some kind. Where's Miss Black? Oh, she's upstairs lying down. The whole affair is upset her, and uh, she asked not to be disturbed. I think the wisest course of action for you, Mr. Spade, is just to let the matter drop. You can't let a murder just drop, Mr. Lewis. The police wouldn't hear it, huh? Murder? Ooh. An unfrocked private detective named Al Kuchel. Well, what does this have to do with Henrietta Black? Al Kuchel called me earlier today and said that Tom Turkey was a crackpot, a little man with delusions. He tried to top me off taking his case. He sounds like a perceiving man. Well, he didn't perceive ending up in my apartment with a bullet in his head. Well, that's too bad, but I still... I left see... Tom Turkey in my apartment for safekeeping, and when I returned, he was gone and Kuchel was dead. Well, that explains itself, obviously. This detective knew that Tom Turkey was a phony, and Turkey killed him. It can figure that way. And a number of other ways. Mr. Fade, I have no desire to sit here trading subtleties with you. As yet, no one has demonstrated that the real Tom Turkey actually exists. Alive. Now, until you do have something more concrete and less mythological, Miss Black requests that you do not come around opening up old wounds. You've made an eloquent point. Just tell me one thing. If I can. When did Tom Turkey disappear? I mean, what month? What day? It was, uh... Oh, yes, uh, 1943, uh, November. But I'm not sure of the exact day. I think it was in the third week. Could it have been on Thanksgiving? Very possibly, very possibly. I returned thoughtfully to my office and did a little rapid mental arithmetic and came up with a number seven. From November 23rd, 1943 to November 23rd, 1950 was seven years to the day. And I pondered this. What did the number seven mean to the life or death of Tom Turkey? I had just hit upon the answer and was crying Eureka when my office door opened, unknocked, and a visitor came in unannounced. He was ugly, heavy set, and looked like an ex longshoreman. I waited to see if the voice checked. You spade? Who shall I say is calling? Yeah, Captain John Smith. And here's my calling card. The first... The first bullet grazed my shoulder and tore the padding out of my coat. The second bullet hit the water cooler and it crashed over water and all on top of me. Where the third bullet hit, I wasn't sure at the time because darkness came mushing through my head like a freight. When I opened my eyes again, I expected to see St. Peter checking my ID card. But all I saw were the dust balls under my desk. And a fly bathing himself in a pool of water, spreading slowly over the floor. There was blood on my hand, but it came from a glass cut. I was in shambles, but alive. Captain John Smith had shoved off, obviously thinking his bullets had done their work. Homicide, Lieutenant Kelsey. Sam Kelsey, have you found anything more about Pond Turkey? Nothing, Sam. Frankly, I'm beginning to wonder if there is such a guy. Well, clever, Kelsey. A few minutes ago, a gorilla by the name, believe it or not, of Captain John Smith just tried to kill me in my office. Oh, go on, Sam. I find it hard to think. You this... find it hard to think, period. Really, Sam? Did you get him? No, but my office is a wreck, and there's a hole blasted in my wall big enough to put a basketball in. Well, what did he use, a bazooka? I figured dum-dum bullets. Dum-dum? Well, that's illegal, ain't it? Kelsey. Doesn't it strike you as significant that every attempt on Turkey's life has been vicious, as if someone not only wanted to kill him, but also mutilate him? Yeah, yeah, now that you mention it. Somebody probably wanted to make identification difficult. Even then, they didn't want anybody to know who he was. Now listen carefully, Kelsey, this yeah. is real deep. Tom Turkey disappeared on Thanksgiving of 1943. A person has to be missing seven years before he can be legally dead and his insurance collected. Now, if someone had Turkey insured, they could collect the day after this Thanksgiving. If Turkey didn't show up before. You mean somebody's trying to kill him for the insurance? I would say so, Kelsey. I would say so. Now hurry up and find him. When I put down the phone, I heard a heavy pounding. For a minute, I thought it was in my head. Until I turned to face the door and... 
standing there was a small pilgrim with bandy legs in black stockings, pantaloons, white collared coat, and stovepipe hat. Hallelujah! He wore silver buckles, and what he was pounding on the floor was an 18th century blunderbuss. Hallelujah! Have I got the right place? For oh, offhand, I'd say so. If you're looking for Captain John Smith, he just left. Pocahontas is expected any minute. <laughs> now, don't you go trying to confuse me. I'm too thirsty. What's on your mind? Well, well I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a fellow named Dan... Uh, uh, oh, I'm so thirsty, I forgot. Sam Spade? Yeah, that's it, that's it, that's it. Ah, oh, you broke your water bottle, huh? Yeah. Good, good. That stuff's poison anyway. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> hey, say, uh... Do you happen to have any hard cider around? For sure. Oh. Uh, I'm kind of thirsty, you know. Any type of corn squeezing? Here. Try this, Dad. Well, well, yeah. Good, huh? Uh, mm. You like that, huh? Uh. Oh. <sighs> hey, follow me. Uh, but before we go... Do you suppose we could have a little something for the road? It's very cold. I gave him a little, but not too much, because I didn't want him to lose his way. He walked me right down Market Street so he could look in the liquor store windows. He said it gave him a comfortable feeling to know there was so much good in the world. And then we turned right a few blocks until we came to the Helping Hand Mission. Across its gray front, a banner promised special holiday food and comfort to the unfortunate. And on the street in front of it, there was a brass band sending out signals to the fraternity that any minute the great feast of Thanksgiving would begin. The band members and other volunteer workers were all dressed as children, but quaint conceit. My pilgrim led me to a dark corner of the club room, and sitting there unhappily was none other than Tom Turkey. Hello, Mr. Oh, hello, Tom. What happened to my apartment? Why did you run away? Well, I was afraid. You told me not to ask for the door until you came back. Well, somebody knocked on the door and said it was you, so I opened it, and two men came in. Tell me, was one of the male coochie? Yes, the detective. The other man was a big, ugly-looking fellow. And when they saw I was alone, they started arguing. About what? Well, the detective said that now that he brought the ugly man there, he wanted his money. Yeah. The ugly man pulled the gun, and they started to fight. Oh, dear, I, I slipped out the door. And when I was halfway downstairs, I heard a shot and kept on running. Well, Al Kuchel is dead. Oh, my. I thought so. This was the only place I could think of to hide. Oh, when Henrietta finds out I've been mixed up in a murder, she'll never take me back. Henrietta. Hey, Tommy, did your wife ever have any insurance on you? Oh, before I ran away, she did. A $50,000 policy, but, oh, that would have lapsed by now. Maybe, maybe. Did it have a suicide clause in it? A suicide? Yes. Uh, well, no. No, it didn't. I remember. Yeah. Yeah, you'd like to talk to Henrietta, wouldn't you? All right, here's your phone number. Call her up and tell her where you are. Oh, you know, I don't think I could. I'm too frightened. You've got to do something to help yourself. If you don't, by midnight, you might be a cold turkey. Oh. I'm sorry, just slipped out. All right, I'll do it. Well, he went and made the call. When he returned, he said that a man had answered. He said Henrietta would come down and pick Tom up. He didn't want to wait, but I sat on him. The pilgrim brought us a dish of turkey dinner, saying he couldn't stand food himself, and we munched the spell. In a little while, a limousine pulled up in front of a mission with someone in back whom I couldn't see. A chauffeur stepped out and came in inquiring for Tom Turkey. It was Captain John Smith himself. When he saw me, a look of shocked surprise came over his unhandsome face. Hoping to catch him off balance, I told Adam. It was the liveliest thing that has happened at the Helping Hand Mission in years. And we had a good house, too. Money was even changing hands. When I heard the odds starting to go against me, I realized I'd better come up with something. Here, use this, partner. And I did. The bandy legged pilgrim shoved his wonderbook right in my hand. And I swung. Smith dropped like pheasant on the wing. I looked up. The passenger from the limousine was just coming in. Yeah, what's the meaning of this? It means, Leander Luce. That you're not going to call Tom Turkey up for your Thanksgiving insurance policy. Hallelujah! <laughs> sick, anyone? Period, end of report. Sam, I don't understand. Well, it's as plain as the cranberry stain on your dress, huh? Hmm? 
Loose as Henrietta's business manager had her power of attorney. And secretly, he kept making the payments on Tom Turkey's insurance policy. Oh, and then he'd collect for Henrietta and keep the money himself. Effie, sometimes your lightning mind frightens me. I'll go type that up. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun and laughs with the chimes later tonight when Ed Gardner stars in Duffy's Tavern. As usual, Duffy won't be there, but Archie, the manager, will definitely be on hand to serve his blue plate special of grilled English language. This Sunday, the big show comes your way again. Tallulah will be your hostess, and the stars include Fred Allen, Jack Carson, Edwin, Meredith Wilson, and many, many more. It's the big show, Sunday, on NBC. and tried to kill you. Was his name really Captain John Smith? No, Wiffy. Could we have a Thanksgiving caper without a Captain John Smith? It wouldn't be right. It was a coincidence, wasn't it? Well, if you promise not to tell anyone. Oh. His real name was Michael Giuseppe Yablonski Smith. I called him John for sure. You're so kind. Mm-hmm. Are we going over to your mother's for cold turkey snacks? Well, all right, but I don't think there'll be much left. Oh? You see, my cousin Judy couldn't find a little boy. And Mother phoned and said we just found him. Mm-hmm. He was inside the turkey, eating his way out. Effie, is there no way to curb that tongue of yours? <laughs> There's one way. Well, come here. Oh. Oh. Good night, sir. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorreen Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by Larry Roman and John Michael Hayes. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbrister. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. <laughs> Detective Agency. Oh, no. Oh, no. I beg your pardon? Swanachi il Campanello. Sam, what are you... Nothing at all, sweetheart. I just happen to have the tourist lists of handy Italian phrases before me. North Beach never did that to you before, Sam. North Beach never did anybody like it just did me, F. But I thought you said old Bartolomeo just wanted you to drop by for a friendly talk. And some garlic bread and red wine. But does that explain the knife gash on my coat? Your new tweet? My old tweet now, Cherub. You see, it was never meant to be swum in. The bay? Yes. Not again. What else? By now, your keen feminine instinct should tell you this is not the social call, Wonder Girl. As a matter of fact, I plan to drop by presto presto with words and enter a little something I call view of fisherman's wharf from the water or the crab Louie caper. <laughs> Transcribed for NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Zing, 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 ding, 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 ding. Belong, John, old Sam. Well, belonging up, huh? Uh, let me see now. Oh, um... Yankee Barrow, un carburetore, tela, calzela. Great, great. What's it mean? I found my secretary's list of most used Italian phrases, Sam. Mm. It means, um, I want a carburetor for my voiturette. I'll remember that. <laughs> so shall we proceed with the business at hand? Ready, Sam. They fill it in. To Bartolomeo Maggiore, copy to Lieutenant Rossi, North Beach Division, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the Crab Louie Caper. Dear Bartolomeo, Fisherman's Wharf, as you know, is as changeable as an Italian wench. All smiles and laughter of a Saturday night with the lights blazing in the Chapino Palazzas and the tourists three deep around the steaming cauldrons outside. But it's something else again of an early dawn. 
Dark and lonely and quiet, except for the mutter of engines as the crab boats nose out into the fog that hang over the gate. Last night was somewhere in between. The lights were blinking out as I left my cab and walked over to your place of business. A gaudily painted building at the foot of the wharf with a red, yellow, and blue sign reading, Museo Maggiore. Curios, souvenirs, waxworks. Admission, ten cents. Who is it? I'm Sam Spade. Bartolomeo called me. He isn't here. That's his grotto at the end of the wharf. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> Look, is there anything I can... Sorry. Except for Flasky's at the very end, the wharf was dark now. It seemed early, as if something had interfered with business as usual, and the late customers had been brushed off a couple hours ahead of time. I peeked through a hole in one of Flasky's window shades and saw why. It looked like the entire population of North Beach was inside. If everyone is ready... One momento. Oh. Who's this? Me? Yes, you. What do you want? I'm Sam Spade. Bartolomeo Maggiore sent for me. Bartolomeo. Hey. Buonasera, il signor Spade. Ah, sì, sì. Obrigado, Mr. Spade. Ah, there, Mr. Spade. You are uh, wondering why you are here? Well, as a matter of fact, I am, Bartolomeo. I thought that... I know, I know. It, uh, it's about my son, Louis. My son, my only son. Oh, he's uh, inside? No, no, not inside. Out in the darkness somewhere. Cold and alone. You, uh... You mean he... See, six days now they have searched for his body. Oh, well, when did it happen? One week today. Crab boat? His boat, the San Felipe. And was he alone when it happened? You detectives, you strike the point. My Louis, always, always he fish alone. Until this time. Who went out with him? Dominic Torrio, his friend, Dominic. This gathering is assembled in Dominic's uh, honor, you see. You mean a uh, hearing or something? Something more than that. Come, listen to that. Yeah. I'm a sick! In my belly, I'm a sick! This old prebuffo! Fast, you should tell him to take it! Keep your temper, Aldo. State facts. Facts, facts, huh? All right, facts. Six years, Louis Fisher, the crab alone. Each day, he's a layover, close the breaker line, and string the pot. Each day, he's a bringing the San Felipe home, hockey dokie. That's right, everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, so, until one fine day, Dominic hit the go with Louis to help. Help. Aldo, Aldo, we must deal in fact. Dominic is suspended. Fast yeah, in the truth. Yeah, he's a kill Louis. Joe is a kill Louis. And you know why? Because he's a want a Rosalia. That's the why. You see how it is. Who is Rosalia? You must have seen her at the museo. Crying? Yes, with reason. Next week, she and my Louis were to be married. It's tough. You think this Dominic was in love with her, maybe? I think nothing, senor. Two men, friends, alone in a boat in a heavy fog. One of them dies. The other says it is an accident. It is not for us to think or make guesses. Say, what am I supposed to do? In the records of the police, senor... My Louis died in an accident. Mm -hmm. In the hearts of his friends, he was murdered. For my sake, for Dominic's, for the sake of us all, we must know the truth. Mm -hmm. For this, I prefer to employ one who is professional and impartial. Come. Yeah. We go in. Uh, I don't believe it, Senor. Believe me, before heaven, I mean it. Silencio. Once again, Dominic. How far was the boat from Seal Rocks? Oh, 100 yards, I think. I'm throwing your tail on the floor. I heard the break. Oh, he's alive. Silencio. Silencio. Let Dominic tell the story. Go on now. You had dropped the last crab pot over the side. Then? Uh, something went wrong with the motor. Louis told me to look at it. I went below, then it happened. Louis was leaning over the gunnel. We untangled a float, and the sea took us by the stern. We broached. I saw him go over and plunge into the white water. I brought the boat about then. For two hours, I yelled, I circled around, I blew the whistle, everything. Then the Coast Guard came. Foskey, I swear it, that's all I know. I never saw that. Ah, Impossible! Silencio! Silencio! My brothers, it was your will that I sit here in judgment of Dominic Torrio. Before I go on, 
Are there any more questions you have to ask him? Are there any among you who have evidence to offer against him? So be it. You know as well as I, there is only one verdict here. The charge is dismissed. The court is adjourned. Everyone was still for a second, like a big tableau. Oski, white-haired and dignified on the platform, looking down at Dominic, and the rest of them all on their feet now, boring holes through them with their eyes. He was the first to move, turning slowly, walking out through the crowd toward the door, looking tentatively from face to face, knowing now he hadn't been acquitted at all, as one by one they turned their backs on him. I felt terribly sorry for Dominic, until he walked past me and I got a look at his face, at his eyes. In my racket, I see that look more often than the next guy. I never saw it any clearer than I did now. It was fear and hatred and guilt. So I left you talking to Fasque, Bartolomeo, and walked back down to the wharf to the museo. Rosalia. Rosa. I told you Bartolomeo is not here. I've seen Bartolomeo. I want to talk to you. Sit down. I don't want to... Sit down. Oh. That's a good girl. It was quite a place, the Museo, a catch-all for everything nautical you'd run across in 60-odd years of living on the sea or next to it. From a 10-foot shark pickled in formaldehyde to a life-size figure of Captain Kidd, complete with drawn sword, lace cuffs, and treasure chest at his feet next to the door. I turned back to Rosalia, sitting on a rum keg under a flickering hurricane lamp, the only light in the room. What do you want of me? Bartolomeo wants the truth about what happened on the San Felipe. They're deciding that at the meeting. They already did. They did? You mean Dominic... How did they decide? Dismiss the charges. No evidence, no witnesses. It was the only thing Fosky could do. You feel better? It uh, doesn't bring back my Louis. No, it doesn't. Dominic's going free now from both the law and his people. No vengeance for Louis. Why were you crying when I came by tonight? Haven't I the right to cry with my Louis? Drop it. Huh? Why didn't you go to the meeting, afraid to give yourself away? I didn't feel like it, that's all. You're a Sicilian, Rosalia. Vengeance is pretty important to you. If you'd loved Louis, you'd have been in there screaming for Dominic's scalp. You shut your mouth. But no, you sat home crying. Not for Louis, but for Dominic, right? How long had it been going on? Did you know Dominic was going to kill him when they put out in the San Felipe? Why would Dominic kill him? Well, that's a stupid question. He's in love with you. <laughs> in love with me. <laughs> in love with me. Drop it. Drop it, Rosalia. In love with me? Oh, I wish it were so. Huh? He killed for me. Is that what they say? It's all very flattering, very. I love Dominic. I've always loved Dominic since I was a little girl. I threw myself at Dominic. And I begged him to marry me. That's not easy for a girl to do, Mr. Spade. I begged him and I promised to work for him to be a slave. You know what he did? He laughed and he spit upon me. And you, you stand there and you tell me that he murdered for the love of me. He wouldn't walk across the street. All right, all right. Take it easy now. Come on, take it easy. So, so I do the silly woman thing. I, I promise myself to Louis. To crazy Louis, to a madman. Crazy? You don't believe that, huh? Louis the Great, your campione. A champion of the crab fisherman who dares to fish right on the breaker line. Catches more crab than anyone else. Louis the Fearless. Do you know why he's fearless? He's too crazy to be afraid. What do you mean? He mutters. He, he talks to himself of great riches, of thousands of dollars, of him and me. Louis the Crab Fisherman and me, living in the finest house in North Beach. When was this? Last week. He went up in Bartolomeo's attic one night and he came down with a big hunk of his raw wax from the waxworks. The tresor, he called it. A stupid lump of wax. And he held it up before me, so. And he says with a mad gleam in his eye, from this, Rosalia, from this, I will carve for us the biggest, finest house you can dream of. Here, look. What's Captain Kidd got to do? Uh, he puts it in the treasure chest. See? Mm -hmm. You will keep this a secret, Rosalia, he says, if you love me. And he laughs again like a madman. Me love Louis Majori? I hated him. <laughs> Good to be phony. The triangle notion had to go. You could hardly blame Rosalia for thinking he was crazy. In the treasure chest was a hunk of tallow, 
Not a very fresh hunk at that. And Louie's routine with it must have hit her like the graveyard scene from Hamlet. Therefore, having no theory, nor evidence, nor witnesses, I also had no motive. As always in situations like this, I did the sensible thing. I went home and went to bed. Or I thought I went to bed. Hello? Spade? Yeah. I got a tip for you. No? Find yourself a nice dirty divorce case somewhere and stay out of North Beach. Well, this almost sounds like a threat. All that advice. There's a hundred bucks in the mail for you. You'll get it this morning. Plus a bribe? A gift. Can I keep it if I don't play? If you don't play, you won't need it. Hmm. I uh, suppose it's useless to ask who this is. Louis Majori. Say that again? Louis Majori, shall I spell it? You might explain it. You talk to Rosalia. Figure it out for yourself. Sure, sure. So she never loved you and you knew it. So you go over the side when the comber hits, swim ashore, then discover they think you're dead and decide to leave it that way rather than go through with a wedding. You got it. I got more. So life without Rosalia in North Beach is impossible. You can't face the shame and loose talk that goes with a busted wedding. So you're going over the hill and find a new life for yourself. Wait a minute, Spade. Oh, there's more, there's more. So you're tossing over a car, a bank account, a boat worth $7,000. Walking out on your old man to say nothing of three years apprenticeship and six years of hard work to get where you are. I understand perfectly. And you're being a little insulting. I make a lot of my dough with my big flat feet. But I do make some of it with my head. Now try again. You don't believe I'm Louis Majori? That is the general idea. And it might surprise you to know that five minutes ago I was ready to chuck the whole antipasto. Now I'm back in with both feet. What's with the music box? Nothing. Tell me, would you know Louis if you saw him? I've seen his picture. Fine. I guess I'll have to prove it to you. If I satisfy you, I'm Louis Majori, will you stay home? Scott. Out's honor. Now where do we prove it? You know Castellani's grotto? Halfway out in the wharf, yeah. There's a ramp running around behind it. I'll see you there in a half hour. I know just what you're going to say, Bartolomeo, but I didn't go alone. Roscoe was right there with me, with his safety off. It was the kind of spot San Francisco puts on once a year for the tourists. Just to nail down its position as runner-up to London. I had to feel my way along the row of dark chowder houses to Catalani's. Except for the foghorn and the lapping of the water below, there wasn't a sound. The only cheerful thing in the picture was Roscoe, who was now out of my pocket at the ready. I eased up to the corner of Castellani's. There was an alley between it and the next building, leading around on the ramp over the water. Hey. I could see the glow of his cigarette first. Then I made him out in a slouch hat and overcoat. He was standing at the rail. Spade. Right here. Well, you're satisfied now? I'll let you know. I moved out from the side of the building and walked toward him. He must have known about Roscoe because he didn't move. Just let me come right up next to him. I was stupid, sure. But it wouldn't have worked for him except for the fog. Two feet away, I saw what I thought was Louie was a booby trap. The hat and overcoat were slung over a piling with a burning cigarette on the rail next to one of the sleeves. I rolled to one side just in time. The knife slashed through the padding on my left shoulder and he was on me. Roscoe went into the drink and I took on the arm with a knife with my two hands, 32 feet. Unhappily, overlooking a spare foot, he knew what to do with it. I went through the railing like an asylum version of the sea wolf. Arriving thus in the limpid and soothing waters of San Francisco Bay. At the moment, I was not sorry. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Sunday, Theater Guild on the Air presents one of the greatest dramatic undertakings in the history of radio. It's a full hour and a half adaptation of Shakespeare's masterpiece, Hamlet. The immortal lines and matchless beauty of Hamlet come to life Sunday with John Gielgud, Dorothy McGuire, and Pamela Brown in Theater Guild on the Air. And a reminder, this Sunday also means another gala broadcast of The Big Show. And now back to the Crab Louie caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Wet.
wetting my finger and holding it up in the wind, I quickly determined where north was and then just as quickly decided there was no percentage in swimming the Golden Gate. A bright blur on my starboard bow called to mind the old saying, where there's a light, there's light. So I headed there. Three strokes this side of exhaustion, I pulled up at what proved to be a landing with a Jacob's Ladder, at the top of which I found the rear entrance to Foskey's. Or more accurately, Foskey's private office. The door was open. Huh? Oh. I'm Sam Spade. I've been swimming, if you're wondering. Bartolomeo told me about you. He didn't say you were crazy. Well, maybe he didn't know. You uh, wouldn't have a brandy lying around loose, would you? Well, sure. Sit down. Thanks. I uh, think I saw Louis tonight. Louis? Impossible. Where? Beyond Castellani's. Yeah. Bless you, Fosky. Oh, hit me again, will you? Yeah, but uh, what about Louis? Call me up. Said he'd meet me there. Just tried to knife me. Oh, but, but it's impossible. Is it? Why would he play dead? And why would he try to kill you? <sighs> Maybe he's crazy. Well, how do you mean? You've heard of the dear old lady who had the trunk full of pancakes, haven't you? Hmm? Louis saves old tallow. Captain Kidd's treasure chest at the museo is full of it. Who told you this? Rosalia showed it to me. Uh, may I? Uh, help yourself. Thanks. Might be a good idea to call another meeting and tell the people. <clears throat> Make it easier for Dominic. <laughs> Funny. Of the whole meeting here, I alone doubt it is guilt. Good thing they made you the judge or he might be six feet under by now. Got a cigarette? In the box there next to the phone. Thanks. Yeah, I, uh, I went right along with him, too. Shows how wrong you can be when... You went what? When you, uh, when you go by emotions and not by evidence. This is, uh, quite a cigarette box. <laughs> yes, it stops when you put it down. Hmm? Well. I, uh, suppose now you'll drop your assignment? Sure, sure. I'm a detective, not a psychiatrist. You've got a lunatic running around. That's your problem. Good night, Fosky, and thanks for the brandy. If Roscoe had been along, I might have played it differently. But when you're sitting across a coffee table from a guy you suddenly realize has the wet cement already, you do what I did. Make polite noises and concentrate on getting out on two feet. It was seven to three. Dominic was stashed in a handy closet listening to the whole thing, which was handy since the next obvious move was his room in a house on Jefferson Street. A rooming house owned and operated by a four corsage bosom type lady known as Mama Luca. Oh, senor, I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing. You're scared, Mama. Did Dominic threaten you? No, no, no don't ask me. Look, I... look. He killed Louis Majori. I gotta know why. I don't know why. I don't know nothing about it. Louis came here? Yes. Yes, Louis came here the night before it happened. Why? Oh, I don't know. He was all excited. A handful of wax. Wax? You know. What about it? He showed it to Dominique, and they go into his room and talk, and then he, he ran off to send a telegram. Telegraph office, huh? Well, since it's official business, I can let you read the office copy. Uh, here. Yeah. This message just came in tonight. Mm. Dominic Torrio. Regarding your inquiry, analysis of samples sent here by Louis Majori, highly promising. If quality uniform and weight correct, would estimate value minimum $60,000. Hartley Associates, Vancouver, B.C. A lump of smelly stuff that looked like old tallow picked out of the ocean and worth $60,000 was a strong enough clue for even stupid Sam to pick up. I left the telegraph office on the double and pulled up at the Museo Maggiore ten minutes later. He was too busy to notice me. I slid a marlin spike out of a rack next to the rum keg. Uh, locked. Must be locked. I hate to do this, Foskey. Uh, wait a minute, mate. Wait a minute. The next voice you'll hear will be the nurse with a breakfast tray. Botolomeo. What have you... Look. What? What have you done? His honor was playing Pandora with Captain Kidd's treasury. Treasure box? Yeah. But why? Who is it? Who? Fusky. Surprised? Fusky? Why would he, of all people? He likes a buck as well as the next one. Possibly even more. When there are 60,000 of them. 60,000 dollars? Yeah. Is he mad? Like a fox. Here, let me pry this cover off. There. What is this? Well, it may not look like much to you and me, but to a perfume manufacturer, it's prettier than the Venus de Milo. Tadlow? Ambergris. It's what happens when a whale gets a tummy ache. 
Louis must have run on to it ten days ago. I didn't mean you. Six thousand dollars. Yeah. That's the big why of it, Bartolomeo. What now? You think Vasky... He won't talk, neither will Dominic. They're next and they know it. Still two men alone in a fog in a boat. See, si. There were only a witness. There was a witness. Hmm? The eye of God was on Dominic when he did it. And the judgment of God is swift and is sure. Dominic knows it. You think so? I know Dominic. Why you ask? There's a way to find out. What time is it? Half past one. There's time. Where do you keep your razor? Razor? Yeah. I'm going to shave Captain Kidd. Which I did, finishing around 2 a.m. During the next three hours, I got wet, cold, and seasick in the order named, but made it back to the museo in time for a couple of stiff horns of grapple before you and I hustled down to the wharf to where Dominic was picking up bait for his crab nets. Dominic? Huh? Oh, the Palomeo. And the Senor Spade. I remember Mr. Spade. Yeah, last night in back of Castellani's. I don't know what you're what talking, you're talking about. about. Sure, Dominic. It's all a horrible mistake. Lay off me, will you? You heard what Bosky said, didn't you? They dropped the charges. I'm innocent. They cleared me. That's just why we're here. We we want to make it up to you, my boy. What's in your mind? You did Louie a great favor, Dominic. When his 32 crab pots got too much for him to handle, you went along to help him. Today, we're going along to help you. Now, uh, when do we cast off? <laughs> There's a float up ahead. What color? Yellow and red. Is that yours, Dominic? That's mine. Great, great. Pull up alongside. Well? What's this all about? I told you, Dominic. You're lying. Going... What are you trying to do? Break me down? He, he's dead in an accident. You heard what Bosky Yeah, said. yeah, yeah, yeah. Forget it, Dominic. Forget it. We love you like a brother. I, I told the truth. I told the truth. What are you trying to do? Torture me? Is that what you want? Revenge? No. The matter is in other hands now. What? You mean... There is always one witness, isn't there, Dominic? Oh, <laughs> that's what you mean, huh? Is that why you came to tell me that? <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> Hold the wheel, Spade. I'll bait my net. I'll spit in your eye one day, old man. One day when you get smart, you and a whole lousy We've war. We both watched him hold the line. Oh, it's playing it on the deck, prattling to himself like a little kid whistling in the dark. He was a lousy actor, pale under his sunburn and drenched with I sweat. I won't let you forget Up it, pal. Coil by coil. To prove to then it began to come slower. And make it stick. When I can prove it in court, I'll sue you till you bleed. I'll... Hey, what's the matter here? What's pulling on this line? Maybe it's your conscience, Dominic. It's, it's heavy. It's... What? The it's... Lord moves in strange ways. Hey, can't get it up. I... Let me help you. There we go. One... Two. Oh. Louis! Get away from me! Let it go! Louis! No! I hauled Louis up onto the deck, and a grisly sight he was, too, with a knife still sticking in his back. I figured that that was where Dominic would put it, and I was right. Not that it mattered, because Dominic wasn't thinking logically from the moment he saw Louie's body tangled in his crab line. He sang us all 50 verses then and there and repeated them for the police stenographer later when we got him to headquarters. It looks like a first-degree rap for both him and Fosky, but I'm waiting till it happens before telling him the corpse was Captain Kidd, minus beard and ruffles. Period. End of report. Sam, again and again I rediscover you. And each time a new facet, a new thrill. You're just wonderful. It's true, true. But it pleases me to hear it from you, F. And so I propose to reward you in a fitting manner. First, Back salary? tut, tut, a carburetor for your washerette. And second, Back salary? ten free tickets to the Museo Maggiore. Third, Back salary? an invitation to accompany me, your employer, to browse upon two bowls of Cipino tonight at Castellani's. And fourth, I give up. Back salary. Sam! Count it, girl, count it, and bless you. The watcherette complete with carburetor will call at your door in precisely one hour. Until then, then... Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. You're invited to a one-hour concert tomorrow by the renowned NBC Symphony under the direction of noted conductor Wilfred Pelletier. 
Featured soloist on tomorrow's symphony performance is Helen Traubel. For the world's greatest music, hear the NBC Symphony tomorrow and every Saturday. Tonight's transcribed adventure of Sam Spade was produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by Harold Swanton. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Miss Perrine. Who did you think it was, Sam? Not a high? You don't know what a hot guess that is, Cherub. Really? Mm-hmm. You think I'm the femme fatale type? In a black velvet gown with a veil? What chance would I have? Sam, you've given me new hearts. Deservedly so, Wonder Girl. And in femme fatale, you have hit upon what might be called the keynote of the saga, which even now I am itching to tell you. A saga? More, a tale, Effie, well calculated to keep you in... Oh, no, we better put that another way. But while I mull a subtitle for this Oriental tapestry, find yourself a copy of something by Eric Ambler or E. Phillips Oppenheim and bone up on the ground rules of international intrigue. Ooh, international? Ooh, yes. The next 39 steps you hear will be me walking up to the door in my black Homburg and velvet collar with my pockets bulging with plans for submarines, supersonic airplanes, and secret fortifications, and my tongue a-wag with a report which will echo around the embassies of the world as the cloak and dagger caper. For NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Sam? Who else? I thought you were kidding. About what? The black Homburg in velvet colored overcoat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But underneath the overcoat, Anne. Same old Sam. <sighs> With the same old suit and the same old shreds. Who did it this time? Thereby hangs the tail. <laughs> huh? It's hanging off the back of your trousers, Sam. What? Your shoe tail. Well, better keep the coat on. Jawara Hal won't mind. Who? Jawara Hal Barra. It's his coat. We'll go into that right now. You ready? Yes, sir. Two. Joara Halbara. K A W A R A H A L B H A R A. Uh huh. Well, speaking. From Samuel Spade, license number one two seven five nine six. Subject. The Cloak and Dagger Caper. Dear Joara Hal. I've been out Friday night until four a.m. watching wedding presents. So when Saturday turned up rainy, I did the mad impulsive thing and decided to stay home. I plugged the phone, built a fire and a tall drink, invited Freddy, the neighbor's cat, in for a short milk, put my feet up and my head down, and reached for a magazine. A picture of peace to our hell. Freddy lay on the coffee table, purred, and busied himself spinning the hand rub lazy suit that my unpredictable Aunt Adelaide gave me for Christmas. The magazine turned out to be time, with a picture of an austere Asiatic gentleman on the cover. Two pages, and I have the kind of headache you can only get from reading the news these days. So I turned it in on a slick pulp with a breathless yarn about an international gumshoe and a satin line cloak who kept running into women with bosoms full of papers. Hmm. And she gazed up at him, her eyes smoldering, heavy lidded. You, she faltered. You are Sheridan Ballard. Mr. G, too? He nodded. Her knife made a glistening eye, sopping as his hand met her wrist, gripping it like a lion. You, you liar, she hissed. With the other hand, he ripped away her veil, smothered her lips in hot, fierce kisses, felt her go limp in his arms. Now, Zelda, my girl, he whispered, let's have the plans for that plutonium-powered rocket ship. <coughs> ah! Veil lady. Mr. Spade? Huh? Well. <clears throat> what can I do for you, Veil lady? You do not mind that I come in, so? How did you come in, so? The door is open. 
I see sitting in chair an attractive man. So. So. You are perhaps working on a remake of The Thief of Baghdad for television. Black tube, of course. Oh, you mean uh, this what I have on? Also this what you haven't on. You keep out of this, Freddy. I saw her first. So, you just happened to be wandering past my door and popped in, is that it? Miss, uh... You may call me Shalimar. Hmm. No, no. I do not just pop in. I come by design. Well, just what kind of designs do you have in mind? Mr. Said, hmm? you are private eyes. Shalimar, I am private eyes. You got troubles? Much. How much? I am beloved of Ahmed. Well, that's nice for Ahmed. Ahmed who? McClatchy. Ahmed McClatchy? How do you explain that? He has two American names. Oh, thank you, thank you. You are a friend of Ahmed, too? Never heard of him. Oh, perhaps, Mr. Spade, perhaps uh, you forget. Ahmed McClatchy? No. No? Never forget a face. What's the matter with Ahmed? Hashish. Dope? Much. He has the wild dream, the night host, the what you call hallucination. Hallucination. You have told others of Ahmed's visit to you? I have told no one of Ahmed's visit to me for the simple reason that he... Oh. Huh? <laughs> Do her not pile upon one falsehood or another. Well, I... Ahmed has to you paid a visit, this I know. Oh? Now, if you would be so kindly, I will join you in the ring. Now, wait a minute. Why don't we... Mm -hmm. You uh, do not want to talk with Shalimar? Well, I uh, just think we ought to clear up this, Miss Underwood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, what do you have? Had I been the Sultan and she Shahrazad, the book would have gone on for twenty more volumes. It was all there, the veil below the eyes, the jackets and long satin pants, plus a superabundance of what Sultans look for when they are employing a harem. I fumbled around putting out an old wet into a couple of martinis, found more milk for Freddy's saucer, and. Then set all three between us on Aunt Adelaide's lazy suit. <laughs> this I like, Mr. Spade. Fine, fine. Now we talk? Uh, drink your milk, Freddy. Now we talk. Uh, oh, uh, you have much? Oh, well, I, oh, my purse. Oh, I'll get it for you. Oh, move now. You're almost stepping up. Oh, so clumsy. Uh, the lipstick is on the chair. Yeah, I see it. I, there we are. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, the light? Got it? Uh-huh. <laughs> now, Mr. Spade, before we talk of Ahmed, let us bring to him, huh? Right. To Ahmed? To Ahmed. <sighs> oh, what's the matter, Freddy? Oh, oh, oh. What? Yeah, look, the uh, note's on the wrong side. He did it again. Did, did what? Well, he likes to spin the lazy Susan. Lazy Susan? What do you do? Now, take it easy, honey. The thing spins. See, you got my drink, I got yours, and Freddie got left out. No. <laughs> oh, no. Damn it. You Look, baby, please. Oh. Don't go off the deep end. Take it easy. What's the, what's the matter with you? Oh, oh yeah. Huh? Shalimar. Oh, Shalimar, baby. Come out of it now, will you? Where's the glass? Oh. I am eight. So, that took care of Shalimar. The purse had nothing except the usual feminine class wrap, hairpins, makeup, and cigarettes. No keys, no identification, nothing, except for a locket around her neck, which was something you don't run into every day. A strange hand-wrought disc-shaped thing with what looked like the face of a clock on it. Twelve Arabic symbols where the hours should be and a pair of hands pointing to four. In some Jawara Hall, it was the sort of thing Sheridan Ballard, the man called G2, yawns over, which struck humdrum me as a little bit out of the ordinary. It struck Lieutenant Dundee of Homicide the same way. Look at me, Sam. Look into my eyes. Dundee, I didn't know you cared. Well, I don't... Uh... No, I am not an idiot, Sam. Well, I've been in this business for 25 years. Mm -hmm. I've looked at a lot of stiffs in my lifetime, yes. but this is the first hoochie-coochie girl in my book who ever walked in out of the rain and tried to poison a total stranger. Well said, Dundee. Hear, hear. So. So. So use your head, Sam. Where have you seen her before? I told you I don't know her, Dundee. And why did she try to kill you? Ask her. Ah, uh, 
Ah, uh, this whole thing's impossible. Mm-hmm. Harem costume, poison, Shalimar. Fantastic, I know. I'm sorry. All right, get out of here. The print man, the MB, and the photographers will be here in a minute. You'll only get in the way. Where'll I go? Anywhere. Find out who this dame is. Who's going to pay my fee? Well, I... Scram. <laughs> Bidding farewell to the gentle lieutenant, I took off into the rain, bound I knew not where. I bought a paper and settled down in a one-armed coffee joint, drank three cups of coffee, and came up with three leads. First, the ballet master at the opera house. Scheherazade, we are not doing till three weeks yet. The costumes are all packed up still, and I am missing no ballerinas. Now again, golden apple princesses. <laughs> Wiggles and waggles, she shimmies and shakes. You never, never saw anything like this, folks. So hurry, hurry, hurry. Direct from a Turkish harem, little Fatima, the girl with the double jointed. Jack. Yeah, Jack. You sure she's in there, Jack? Wait a minute, Jack. Yeah, she's in there, man. Thanks, man. All right, folks, step in a little closer. She shakes. Sorry, but I can't help you a bit. This here Turkish bat is 100% bad. Homeward bound, I was walking down Grant Avenue when I passed a little shop near Pine Street. Gold lettering on one corner of the window spelled out Hatchadurian J. Pappas, importer, Curio. What do you do, sir? Hatchadurian J. Pappas? You get the pleasure. What's the J for? Never mind, kid, though. You can pronounce it. I accept your apology. Now, will you take a look at this? Huh? Oh, lucky. Huh? Uh-huh. Yes, lucky it is. Where do you get this lucky, uh, sir? I, uh, I found it. I thought you might recognize it. Yeah, I think I do. Uh-huh. You know, strange is that have come here. And yet, not so strange either, if you want to look at it. Well, which is it? Sure, sure. Uh, you know, I'm perhaps the only fellow in town who might have dealt in this kind of stuff here. It's quite uh, genuine. Oh, you mean you sold this? Probably. Sure, sure. Who, who to? I'm trying to remember. A girl? A girl. Or, or was it a fella? I... A young fella? Or old fella? Well, that leaves only one more category. Huh? An old woman. Oh, you know her then? No, no, I don't know her, no. You know, I wish I could remember to whom I saw this. Yeah. It's been such a long time, you know. Of course, I can look it up and call you, Sport. Good. Here's uh, here's my card. Oh, Sam Sport. Sam. Well, if you want to look at it. Uh, you said it's uh, genuine, huh? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, secret Society medallion. 16th century. It's from the Indian state of Kashmir. Kashmir? Sure, kiddo. Kashmir. What's the matter with you? Don't you understand English? Kazmir, a typical spade blunder. All I could think of was a girl on a cigarette package, thereby confining my operations to Turkey. But this opened new doors. The first, the most obvious, and ultimately the correct choice, was a flossy nightclub known to the town's well-heeled party folk as the Vale of Kashmir. It was dark when I got there, but the front doors hadn't opened yet. Around at the side, an alley led up to the trade entrance, next to which stood a huge, wedge-shaped character with a swarthy complexion marred by a scar down one cheek. And to make him even more Oppenheimish, he was wrapped in a black, tent-sized opera cloak. I nodded politely, he spat, and I went inside. The Vale of Kashmir is a sumptuous bistro even on ordinary nights, and this night was obviously to be more than ordinary. The table across the end of the floor was banquet size. The place was hung with Kashmiri flags, and the picture of an old man who looked familiar was hung from the middle of one wall. The maitre d' was talking to an important-looking gent near the long table, and I walked over to them, pausing only to note one of the dancing girls practicing in a corner in her Shalimar-type costume. Felt like I was close to home. And the uh, curry, you understand? Not too hot, yes, Excellency. It can be as you wish. The florist will be here promptly with the flowers. Mm-hmm. I trust you will be prepared to take care of uh, the Excuse friends. me, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Spain. Lush put sir, at your service. Please, Mr. Spade, we have... No, 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 not at all, not at all, my good man. What? 
What is it, Mr. Spade? Are you uh, in charge here? I am the head waiter, sir. This gentleman is the Kashmiri proconsul. Oh, forgive me, Your Excellency, but... Uh, yeah, sorry. Not at all. Uh, do you have a dancing girl here named Shalimar? Shalimar? No. What? Probably use another name. How about Ahmed? McClatchy. Right. Where is he? A former employee as of this afternoon is Ahmed McClatchy. Who? Who is he? My chef. Today of all times, he does not show up. You know where he lives? No, oh, I can look it up, but... Please, sir, the proconsul and I in the banquet tonight. The arrangements, the prime minister himself. Sure, sure, sure. Can. Just one more thing. A proconsul. Have you ever seen one of these before? Hmm. What is it? A secret society medallion, they tell me. Who? Who tells you this? Octavian Papa. Runs a little curio store on Grand Avenue. Know anything about it? Secret society is right. The circle of twelve. You see here? Hmm? The hands point to four. Yes, the fourth member, this means. The hand straight up is the leader. You seem to know what you are talking about, head waiter. <laughs> Kashmiri culture is a hobby of mine, Excellency. This is an ancient, uh, how do you say, subversive organization dating from the time of the Mughal conquest of the 16th century. Very interesting. Yes. But of little significance now. The Circle of Twelve has been dead... For three centuries. Uh, if you will excuse me, Excellency, I'll get for Mr. Spade Ahmed's address, and then I will... Hold it. Ahmed! He just made it to the table, swept the sugar bowl off it, and followed it to the deck. When I saw the dagger in his back, I grabbed my gun and set sail for the alley, looking for the cloak that went with it, but he was gone. So was Ackman. I bent down over him, took a closer look, and saw why he spilled the sugar. With his finger, he placed a design in it. A round design. The Circle of Twelve. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. <laughs> There's a bright newcomer to your NBC Sunday lineup starting this Sunday. It's Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. Now you can follow the further delightful adventures of the beleaguered Blandings in their famous dream house every Sunday. Starring as Mr. and Mrs. Blandings will be Cary Grant and his charming wife, Betsy Drake. Mr. and Mrs. Blandings is followed over most of these NBC stations by The Big Show. And this Sunday, hostess Tallulah Bankhead will present such bright stars as Fred Allen, Judy Holliday, Patrice Munsell, Gypsy Rose Lee, Vaughn Monroe, and many, many more. The chimes are your invitation. And now back to the Cloak and Dagger Caper, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Well, Joanna, all the ingredients of a first-class international goulash were here. The cloak, the dagger, the man with a scar on his face, the lady with a veil over hers, and two corpses. By now, Dundee had completed activities with corpse number one at my apartment, so I hustled him down to the Vale of Cashmere and put him to work on number two. Then I hustled back to my office. The big question had yet to be answered. Now, another. Oh, Dad! Hmm? Oh. About Ackman McClatchy, right? And the girl with the girl. Shalimar. Is that her name? Probably not, but it doesn't matter to her now. What about Ackman? Oh, you were frightened out of his wits. He said somebody was going to kill him, and I told him he'd come to just the right place because you were strong and brave and Good. wonderful. Good. And, and he cried. Good. And I cried. Good, good. But wait, wait, wait. Hold it, F. Yes, sir. What happened when all the crying was over? Well, I sent him up to see you, Sam. I couldn't He call. just told you somebody was going to kill him, that's all? Yes, Sam. That's why he was crying? Oh, no, Sam, no. That's not why Ackman was crying. Why? He didn't care for himself. He's, he's a, a selfless, generous guy. Angel child, who was Ackman crying over? A man in the paper. What paper? He's in all the papers, Sam. The Chronicle and the Examiner and the Call and, and even on the cover of Time this week. You see? A banquet. That's whose picture it was. For Jawal Hall Barra, the, mm. the Prime Minister of Kashmir. Look at the small print underneath, Sam. On him, the hopes of Asia. You see, that's 
I've heard Ahmed, Sam. Not for himself. He said they're going to kill Sir Jawara Hall. <laughs> Two paragraphs later, my taciturn secretary let slip the information that Shalimar had arrived at the office five minutes after Ahmed left and departed for my home and hearth loaded for bear. The hullabaloo over you, Jawara Hall, was due to the fact that you were at this moment arriving on the steamer Pacifica, en route to Washington with, as the article put it, the destiny of the Middle East in your briefcase. Ten minutes later, I was fighting my way through the mob at Pier 42. Not just a mob, mind you, but an assortment of bands, a Hindu delegation, the full membership of the Sanskrit Society at the University of California, with a huge banner reading, Jawara Howe, we're with you, and an override soprano on a pedestal singing, Hail Hands I Love. I struggled through this to the curb just in time to see you pull away in your special limousine, then climbed over some more backs to a phone book. Hail Hands I Love You. I am there's me recount for it. Rajput Singh is speaking. Look, this is Sam Spade, Mr. Singh. Oh, oh, yes. Has the Prime Minister arrived there yet? He's due any minute. Why? Well, you better call out the guard. They're going to try to assassinate him tonight. My good man, do you realize My what good you... man, I know whereof I speak. The cook at the restaurant. Ahmed. Yes. That is what... Yes, you're getting the idea, all right. It's the old circle of 12 with a brand new paint job. Now get on it. <laughs> My next move may sound to you like a combination of negligence, indolence, and ennui, Jawara Al, but I must remind you that I was not employed on this caper, was receiving no stipend for risking my ever-loving neck, and had added up the figures in the problem of primary interest to me, namely, the lady who tried to kill me on page two. I therefore entrusted responsibility for your health and that of the Middle East to the proconsul, made my way home, put on my slippers, and set the lazy Susan on the floor this time for Freddy to play with. Where was I? Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, Zelda, my girl, he whispered, let's have the plan for that plutonium-powered rocket ship. Mm. Somehow, this all seems logical now. Never, she breathed. Rather death, Mr. G2, than to betray my country. Quiet, Freddy. Mm. Oh, no, 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 not the buddy. Oh, no. Mr. Spade. Oh, hello, Pro Council. May I? Do, do, do. I have taken every precaution. The Prime Minister, he's on his way to the banquet now. Good. There's one thing I must ask of you. How? Absolute secrecy. Yes. The mere knowledge of that such an organization as this... this Circle of Twelve? Yes, exists will give added strength to a disloyal opposition in our country that may express itself in a manner disastrous to our purposes in sending Jawaharlal to Washington. You understand? Well, it's taken me a while to learn the ground rules in the International League, but I get the general idea. Uh, you you have spoken of this to no while. No. Oh, excuse me. Hello? This is Hatsudurian J. Papa, sir. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, it took me a great deal of long time to check my record, Mr. Spade, but I finally found it. Oh, uh, what's that? Uh, the gentleman who bought the set of 12 Kashmiri medallions, like the one you saw me in my shop. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, his name... Is Rajput Singh, a foreigner fellow, I think. He's the Kashmiri pro consul here. Oh, oh, well, uh, gosh, thanks, Dorothy. This is Hajidurian J. Papa, sir. You f- I found it just now. Well, Dorothy, it. after all you've done for Alice, the least she could do is thank you. And you can tell her that for me. Now, bye, honey. So long, kiddo. Silly kids, silly. Let's see now, uh, where were we? Uh, you had just given me your assurance. You would maintain such a secrecy in this unfortunate matter. Oh, yes, sir. Now, I must go. They're expecting me at the banquet there. Thank you again, sir. Not at all. Your service to our country and the world will find expression, I hope, on some later day. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Freddy, please, not now. Yeah. Down the phone. Well... Cloak and dagger in the flesh. Going modern on me with that gun, eh? Put down the phone. What if I told you I'd already made the call? I say you were lying. The line is tapped outside. You figure the angles, Hefty. In my business, I have to. When's it coming off? For the Prime Minister any minute. For you right now. Oh. He's got you fooled too, huh? They're right there. 
too. Rashford, you're a fall guy, you know, doing the heavy stuff. If it kicks back, you get it, and the other ten laugh. You think you could talk me out of it, huh? Why, that's the last thing in my mind. I'd never... <laughs> Everything happened at once. As near as I can recall, it began when Coke and Dagger backed onto Freddy's tail. Freddy yelled, spun like a top, and C and D off balance, put his other foot on Aunt Adelaide's lazy Susan. Hardly a place for a big off balance man to place his only remaining foot. <laughs> About then, I kicked him in the stomach, grabbed with a gun, which skidded into a corner, and we went over and over for a while. C and D tore at my suit with his claws and teeth. I beat his head with an ashtray, and Freddy sat quietly in the corner and washed himself. At length, tiring of the ashtray, I beat his head on the radiator. And dear Cloak and Dagger gave it up with a long, unhappy sigh. This is a business up affair. I Get out of my way, head waiter, or I'll walk right over that white shirt front. Please, I can't. Have they been served anything yet? Uh, the drinks are just coming on. I wait, oh. wait, I should just go. And now, now, my countrymen, before we introduce our guest of honor, Sir Jawara Halbara, our beloved prime minister, I suggest we rise and toast our country. <laughs> To Kashmir. May she... Go ahead, proconsul. Don't let me interrupt. Uh, please, not here. The standard remark is, what is the meaning of this? Aren't you going to ask me? I'm supposed to be dead. Is that what's throwing you? Mr. Spade, please, a toast is about to be drunk. Thank you. Where's my drink, proconsul? Gentlemen, gentlemen. There was at one time a custom in our country for the host to exchange glasses with the guests of honor. Permit me, Jawarahal. To. To Kashmir. And the moral of this story, if there is one, is when danger threatens, don't hire a bodyguard, buy a cat and a lazy Susan. Period. End of report. Oh, Sam. Why do people do these things? Oh, we all have different loyalties, have different ideas about duty. Yes? Yeah. My duty, for instance, is to pick up a knot in my head and a suit full of holes once a week. While your duty You don't need to... to draw a diagram, Sam. I, I can take a hint. Scoop. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. This Sunday, Theater Guild on the Air presents a light, laughable, lovable comedy. It's The Fortune Hunter, and it stars Gene Crane and John Lund. You're invited Sunday to another outstanding one-hour production by Theater Guild on the Air. And a reminder, there's a bright newcomer to your big Sunday lineup on NBC. Mr. and Mrs. Landing, starring Terry Grant and Betsy Drake. <laughs> Ah, how can I do this? Something wrong? Wrong, the papers. The plutonium-powered rocket ship? What else? A dumper if I ever read one, F. The plans turned out sour. Oh, what were they? The veil lady had entered a breakfast cereal contest. <laughs> well, that's life, little one. We struggle, we strive, we think we have success in our grasp, and it turns out dross. Oh, that reminds me. Hmm? How do you like it? What? My new dross. Hmm. <laughs> And uh, that concludes the dialogue for tonight. Except for one thing, of course. Oh, I'm ready, Sam. Mm. Mm. <laughs> uh, who wants to be the man called X? He has a different one every week. I am the man called Spade. Constant, faithful, Semper Fidelis. That's me. Good night, Mr. Fidelis. Uh, good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by Harold Quanton. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. <laughs>
the National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Oh, you. What's the matter now? Oh, nothing. You just up and leave and don't say where you're going, and I'm only your secretary, and I'm the last one to know about it, and everybody else in town knows more than I do, and I wasn't here Enough, before. enough, enough. Wait a minute. How did everybody in town know about it? Well, it was in the newspapers, that's all. In the society column, no less. Really? Well, imagine that. Flora Bell Frolic's column. Flora Bell. Mr. Spade, the notorious private detective, is vacationing at Westover as a guest of a promising young architect, Garrett Welch. Notorious, yet. Yeah. Well, at least they spell my name right. I suppose you had a great time. Well, it was exciting. What did you do? Just talked over old times, F. Did a little hunting, a little shooting. Did you bag anything? F, watch your language. Sam. I see you're shocked. Well, so was I. However, if you have nothing to do, hang around the office, and I will be down with several pages from my diary telling about the whole affair. I've titled them, The Civic Pride Caper. <laughs> For NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer, director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all, starring Stephen Dunn in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Effie! Oh, here I am, Sam. Well, I thought you'd gone chicken and run out on me. You're part of this organization. You're going to bear the bitter with the sweet along with the rest of us. I know, but I always seem to get the bitter. Hmm? Friday's when the sweets will be given out. Don't quibble, don't quibble. This is a nasty job we have here. We might just as well sit down and get it over with. You care for a drink? You might need it. No, thanks. I don't need false bravery. <sighs> Lucky you. Well, are you ready? No, but we might as well start. Well, you know best. Date, fill it in to Garrett Welsh, room 212, Fairchild Building, Westover, California. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the Civic Pride Caper. Dear Garrett... I'd never been in Westover before, and I found it, on the surface at least, an attractive, bustling little city. The streets were clean, and the girls were sun-kissed and friendly. Add to that the $150 you sent me by mail, and you can imagine with what pleasant feelings I arrived. I found the Fairchild building easily enough, and room 212, well, I couldn't miss it. There were sounds of vigorous activity coming out through the transom. And when I opened the door, two men were engaged in a fight. One was big and one was little. I didn't know which one was my client, so I automatically reached for the big guy. Let go of me. What do you think you're doing? What's it all about? Oh, ask him, he'll tell you. All right, what's the story? I was being foully and unreasonably attacked by this... Misguided citizen. I ought to kill you. That's what I ought to do. That's what everybody ought to do. Hold still. Why? Oh, let him go. Let him go. Beat it, Carson. Wait until you can catch me alone in some dark alley. Don't think I won't. Don't you think I won't. I'm sure you will. I'm going to catch you every place and every time I can. (laughs) Well, I take it your name is Garrett Welsh. It is. It is. And I want to thank you, friend. Nothing. You rescued me from a... Rather unhappy, breeding. And your mouth is kind of cut up. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing I can't take care of. Drink? I have never touched you. Oh. You. You you might have. Might have noticed I've already had a few drinks today. Well, it helps me forget. And it also keeps me from thinking. There you are. No, thanks. Uh, my name is Spade. Why did you send for me? Bodyguard? No, no, no. <laughs> Let them have their fun. I don't mind. Maybe I even deserve it. Look, you're paying for my time. Why don't we uh, get with it, huh? Hmm? Oh, sure. Why not? Good. Come over here to the window. Yeah. Look out there. Where? The far corner. Oh, you mean that building? Pile of rubbish is a better description. Well, what happened? Fire? No. It just collapsed one night. Last week. There were more than 3,000 people in it at the time. Five of them were killed. I don't know how many injured. That's too bad. How did it happen? It just collapsed. Another drink? No, thanks. Pardon me? It was a municipal auditorium built to honor the war dead. It cost over a million (laughs) dollars. I was the architect. Oh. 
I was picked by the townspeople for the singular honor of designing the Fond Memorial. Well, now they have something to remember. What'd you do wrong? Nothing. Nothing. Somebody cheated in the building of it. Somebody didn't follow my plans. I don't know who it is. I don't know who it was. Or just where to place the blame. So? You're a private investigator? What can you do? Get you some black coffee and ask you some questions. He gave me a list of everybody in town who had something to do with the building. First off, I called on a man named Howard Kessley, whose construction company had the contract for erecting the auditorium. Kessley lived in an elegant house on a well-guarded estate. And after they took my gun away from me, they let me in. I waited in a room tastefully decorated with original oil paintings and oriental rugs. And eventually, a football hero-type man walked in. You from the insurance company? No, I'm a private detective, Sam Spade. Who are you working for? Garrett Welch. Huh. That's a laugh. Funny. Well, what do you want? Look, you built that auditorium. Have you any idea why it fell down? Maybe it just got tired. I don't know. Aren't you interested? We're looking into it now. Who's we? My company engineers. That Garrett Welch. An architect. (laughs) We should have had somebody who knew what he was doing. Do you have any copies of the building specifications that I might look at? Sure. Yeah, I got nothing to hide. You can go back and tell Garrett Welch that the best thing he can do is get out of town. Or somebody tries to knock him off and succeed. Yeah. Here. There's a copy of the plans. Look at it all you want. You'll find I did what I was supposed to do. I got my gun back from the guards and left with the building specifications tucked under my arm. They didn't mean a thing to me, of course. I'd only asked for them to see whether he'd refuse to show them. But out of curiosity, I enrolled them just for a look before dumping them into the ash can. And I noticed something. The last page was signed and approved by the city building inspector, a man named Albert Mitchell. Well? Uh, Well, I don't usually receive callers at this hour, but you're a little better looking than the ordinary caller. Come in. She was slim and auburn-haired and wore an insolent smile that was interesting and a clinging silk thing that was interesting. She looked me up and down and she took so long at it. Okay. Okay, what is it? Magazines? Uh, I... The gas meter? Or did you just lose your way? I'd uh, like to talk to Albert Mitchell. Oh, he's a dull conversationalist. You wouldn't have any fun. Well, I wasn't exactly looking for laughs, Mrs. Uh, You are Mrs. Mitchell? More or less. Right now, less. Soda or water? What? And your drink. Oh, thanks, but I took the pledge last Halloween. What did you want to talk to Al about? Well, what else? The auditorium that collapsed. Well, he stepped out for a while. Why don't we just make ourselves comfortable? Uh, you have a standard answer when I'm on duty. Thanks, anyway. Duty? You a cop? I've never seen you around this town before. Private type investigator. Sam Spade. My name's Kitty. Uh, you don't have to worry about Al busting in on us. I don't think he'll be back this week. That's what I thought, you holding open house and all. What's the matter? The pressure got too heavy for him? Look, Sam, they had a hearing a couple of days ago. It was all decided. Nobody was to blame. I think Al went fishing or something. Where is he? How should I know? I'm only his wife. Well, you know what they say about a man who runs. Yeah. So why don't you stick around? You don't look like a coward to me. Well, when it comes to redheads, I really am. So long, Kitty. But... Oh, by the way, if Al does ever show up, tell him I took a room at the Embassy Hotel. I'd like him to call me. I won't tell him a thing. Come back here, you coward. Hey, Sam! I went down to the wreckage of the auditorium. It was late and the streets were quiet and deserted. I walked through the twisted shell of the building, striking matches and looking around. I didn't know what I was looking for, but apparently I wasn't the only one visiting the scene of the crime. I was standing just inside the gutted remains of what was once the lobby when it happened. Gunfire cut through to the back of the building. I ran toward the noise, and when I turned the back corner, I saw a cloud of plaster dust where the shots had apparently been fired. There were no people or cars in sight, but on the sidewalk, on hands and knees, was a man. Rats. Rats. Double-crossing dirty rats. Save me. 
don't let me die. Kitty. He grabbed my legs and tried to pull himself up. His face was a gargoyle of pain. I reached down to help him, but he slipped back to the sidewalk, dead. Four bullets had gone through his back. A billfold fell out of his pocket. It was loaded with identification, and everything said Albert Mitchell, age 40. Occupation, building inspector. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. This Sunday, Theater Guild on the Air presents an exciting one-hour adaptation of the Broadway stage comedy Light Up the Sky. Starring in this Theater Guild production are Joan Bennett, Sam Levine, and Thelma Ritter. And on Sunday, you're invited to another hour-and-a-half broadcast of The Big Show. Starring Eddie Arnold, Jack Carson, Eddie Cantor, Olivia de Havilland, Martha Ray, Meredith Wilson, and many more. Your MC, of course, is the glamorous and unpredictable Tallulah. And now back to the Civic Pride Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. A good many other people had heard the sound of Albert Mitchell's assassination, and before long, a crowd had gathered. Among them were several minions of the law. They took two people in tow, the dead Mitchell and the live Spade. The Westover Police Department had themselves a fine time over me. It seems I was hired out-of-town killer and therefore eligible to be questioned all night. They worked hard at it, but in the morning, they had to admit defeat and release me. I think they only did it because they didn't want to pay for my breakfast. By then, I was pretty mad, and at 10 o'clock, I walked into the mayor's office and demanded an interview. I got it. The whole thing, Mr. Spade, was regrettable. But after all, you are a stranger here. And when a man is killed and someone happens to be in on the scene, questions have to be asked. Your Honor, I'll let it pass in the interests of law enforcement. Good. You, uh, uh, our report on you from San Francisco gives you quite a reputation as an investigator. Uh, do you have any theories that might uh, help us in this murder of Mitchell? Well, I could hazard an expert guess that it's tied in with a building scandal. The auditorium collapsed. By the way, what's being done officially to fix the blame for that? Uh, the city council held its investigation of the unfortunate affair last week. And as far as we can determine, no one is directly responsible. No one? Oh, come, come, Your Honor. Are you questioning our civic procedure? <sighs> oh, well, maybe you're right. Maybe we've been too easygoing. We're all neighbors here. Yes, I'm friends. conducting an investigation for a client who certainly has a right to know what's going on insofar as a good many citizens seem to feel he's to blame. Oh, yes, Mr. Welch. Well, he's not to blame. No one is. You must pardon my abruptness, Mr. Spade, but the events of the past week have been a little yes, more... Yes, yes, than... I know. Tell me, Albert Mitchell, as building inspector, must have approved the building of the auditorium. Now, was he a reliable man? Yes. Wait a minute. You don't think... I that... think he was killed by somebody who wanted him to keep his mouth shut. Now, what about the contractor, Howard Kessley? Kessley? Born here. Brought up here. He's built about one-third of the structures in Westover. Uh -huh. Every one of them, except the auditorium, is standing today. No, I, I don't think you can build up a case... I'm just examining the possibilities, oh. all right? You have to begin with the people who had something to gain from this thing. Where there's graft, there might be murder. Where are the purchase orders for the materials used in this building? That was the first question I asked. I was told they were destroyed with all the other useless paperwork that accumulated from the construction job. Oh, great, great. That certainly makes it convenient for somebody. Mr. Spade, I, I don't wish to... And I can't believe, as you apparently do, that this town's population is... is crooked and rotten. So if I come across any information that will help clear the good name of Garrett Welsh... You can be sure that I'll be happy to bring it to your attention. Until then, I bid you good day, sir. I could understand Mayor Sullivan's desire to protect the fair name of his city, but I had to take a meaner view of at least one Westover citizen. I found out where Albert Mitchell did his banking and misrepresenting myself as a collection agent pried into his holdings. Let me see now, Mr. Humboldt. I really shouldn't give out this kind of information, but in your case, when you have a claim against the estate, I'd... Oh, yes, yes, here it is. Uh, 
He has $300 in his account. That's all. What kind of deposits did he make? Oh, just paychecks mostly. He was a $7,500 a year man. Every Friday he deposited $150. Any deposits larger at any time? Oh, yes. Four deposits of $5,000 each in the past uh, year. Well, what do you know? As I recall Mr. Mitchell saying, there were payments from the state he inherited. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Carter. You'll hear from my company soon, I'm sure. Yes. Oh, uh, what was the name of your company again, uh, for my records? Amalgamated Whistle. Oh, yes. Uh, preferred. Oh, yes, of course. That inheritance gag was right out of the Kefauver investigation. An inheritance is paid in a lump sum, practically never in four payments of 5000 each. I didn't know whether Mrs. Mitchell was receiving, but I decided to find out. When I knocked at her door, all was quiet inside, but a second after my knock, there was a burst of sorrow. When she came to the door, there were two rather impossible-sized tears flowing down her face. For widow's weed, she wore a black dress, tight, satin, and low-cut. Oh, Mr. Spade, I'm in no mood for talking now. Oh, just for a moment, may I come in? I guess so. I'm really kind of alone and lost. What is it you want? I must apologize for intruding on your bereavement, Mrs. Mitchell. I'm not usually as callous. Oh, that's all right. But I'm not sure I can help you any. I'm so broken up. What is it, Camphor? What? Whatever you use to make those tears. All right, so I can't really cry. I never have, but it's expected of me. Well, all right. In that case, I sympathize with you. What do you want? Kitty, your dear departed husband made 7500 a year and deposited 20000 in eight months. I want to buy it. I don't know anything about his money. All I know is that the bank told me he had only 300 left. What did he do with it? He spent it on other women. Oh, I see. So the artificial tears do make sense, I guess. No. No, you don't understand. It's not that simple. It's funny, Sam, because I really mean it. Oh, I know how stupid I look in these clothes. And I did use camphor on my eyes because I wanted to cry. I wanted to cry for all the good days and the good years Al and I had. But the bad years kept getting in between, and I couldn't do it. I like you better all the time, Kitty. I knew you were real pretty. Now it turns out you're pretty real. I really loved him, and he loved me. But we kicked it away. Because we both wanted more excitement than this town or his salary could give us. There was no place to go. We just didn't get along. He was out spending his money on other women, being a big shot. Uh, I can't blame him, though. I helped make him do it. What about the money? He got it for falsifying the auditorium inspection papers, didn't he? Well, he didn't get it for inventing television. Who paid him? Sam, don't ask me anymore. Well, you do know where the 20000 came from, don't you, Kitty? Don't, Sam. I'm scared. You know what you ought to do? You ought to come back to San Francisco with me. Let me help you get a job there. You can make a fresh start. You're not kidding. I give you my word. I ought to have my head examined for trusting you, but I'm going to do it. Al got that money from the Central Cement Company for, quote, an advisory capacity, unquote. Mm-hmm. You know who owns the Central Cement Company? Howard Kessley. Warm, but not quite. His brother. Last night when Al showed up in town, he was gunning for trouble. Why? He said they were going to make a fall guy out of him and that he wasn't going to take the blame for anybody. That's what he said. Uh But I think he ran out of money and wanted to make a touch in exchange for disappearing again. For good. And you think Kesley shot him or his brother? I can't think, and I don't know anything else. Now, do I get to San Francisco? I'll be back for you. All right, but make it fast. And don't leave me here, because if anything happens to me, Sam, it'll be on your conscience. She walked to the door with me and kissed me on the cheek. And it was nice. No more than that. It was nice. Next stop, the Central Cement Company office. A statement of Howard Kessler's brother, Ralph. I'll explain it to you in simple terms. We supplied cement for a lot of buildings in this part of the country. When you want to build something, you submit a bid. When you want to know what kind of a bid to submit, you ask an expert. Mitchell was our expert. And we didn't expect him to work for nothing. You mean Mitchell tipped you off as to what other firms were bidding? Well, call it anything you want. It's done all the time. I found Garrett Welch, my architect client, slumped over his desk, much the worse for drink, and it took a good half hour with coffee and wet cloths to bring him around to something resembling normal. I was... I was proud of that building, Mr. Spade. As proud once as I am ashamed of it now. 
I spent four years at a prominent American college and two years apprenticeship with a great architect to prepare myself to come back here and make this the most beautiful city in the West. Well, you must have watched them build it. What went wrong? That's a point. I wasn't here. They sent me to Chicago to study. And I bit for it. What they really wanted was for me to be out of the way. Who are they? The city council. Oh, why bother? Just tell me how much I owe you and we'll just forget it. Nobody's going to indict anybody for anything. Well, somebody's responsible for the building and for Mitchell's murder, and we'll find him. We? Yeah. If you lay off that bottle for a while and work with me, maybe we can do it. All right. All right. No more booze. I'll stop feeling sorry for myself and start getting mad. Hey, where are you going? I'm going to start at the top. I'm going to try to get the mayor to help. You say you've turned up something, Mr. Spade? A lot of something, Your Honor. I've ferreted out copies of the purchase orders for the materials used in that building. They were generally inferior and below the quality required by sound engineering and the law. Oh, you can't mean it. I do. You can inform your district attorney that in a matter of two or three days, I will move for an indictment of several people in this community for gross criminal negligence. Now, I want to know whether or not I'll have your full cooperation. There's no question of that. I'll cooperate with you fully to prosecute Thank you, Your Honor, and good day. Just a minute. Yeah? About uh, Howard Kessley. What about him? Do you still consider that he is subject to suspicion? The families of the five people who died in the ruins would think anybody who was concerned in the building project were subject to suspicion, Your Honor. Mr. Spade, you, you know about politics. Certain people contributed campaign, campaign funds and got me votes. Kessley? I, I've been in a difficult position. I, I've been weak, perhaps. Maybe I haven't wanted to look too closely at certain possibilities in this... This horrible affair. But I promise you, I won't stop now. It doesn't matter what happens. My first duty is to the citizens of this town. Well said, Your Honor. Just tell the same thing to the other members of the city council. Tell them that if I kick the lid off this garbage can, it's going to make Westover smell pretty bad. You'll hear from me, Mr. Spade. I guarantee you. In the course of the next two hours, I told the same story to the newspaper, the police, a couple of soda jerks, a waitress, and almost anybody else who would listen. And before the day was out, the results started coming in. Garrett Welch's office and my room at the Embassy Hotel were both ransacked. Somebody started shadowing me, and uh, I had a mysterious phone call offering me money to get out of town. I refused and hung up. During that day, I stayed mostly out in the open in conspicuous parts of town. But when night fell, I knew I'd need to watch my step. Garrett Welch and I holed up in his office with the door locked and my gun out on the desk. Around 11, we got a little action. Well, speaking. Yeah? Yeah, okay. It's for you, Spade. Hello? Sam, this is Kitty Mitchell. I'm in trouble. What kind? Three men were just here. They said I gave you some purchase orders. I don't know anything about them, but they said if I didn't get them back from you by midnight, they'd kill me. Who were they? I don't know. I don't know. Just men. If you've got them, give them to me, Sam. I don't want to die. Look, hang up. Call the police and ask them for protection. Sam, I'm afraid. Why don't you give me the papers? Get in a taxi cab and come up to Garrett Welsh's office. We'll talk it over. I'm afraid to do that. Well, you'll have to. I can't leave here. I'm waiting for somebody. Who? I'm not sure yet. Somebody threatened Mitchell's wife. She's coming up here. Well, I think we have enough to do taking care of ourselves. Uh, who's that? Go on, you answer it. Then uh, step to one side. I'll keep you covered. Okay. Don't make one wrong move. I'm not going to, Spade. I came here to talk. Kessley? Yes. Who's with you, Kessley? Nobody. I'm alone and unarmed. Come in. Uh, I'm watching you from behind, Kessley. I know it. I just came to talk. All right, talk. Spade, you allegedly have information as to why the auditorium collapsed, killing five people. Suppose I do. Well, I came to make a deal with you. We're not making deals. I think you'll like this one. I'll give you all the positive information you want for one thing. Namely? A 48-hour head start out of town. Why should we give you that? Because nobody... Least of all, myself thought the building would collapse. It's true I used inferior materials, but I had to. What does that mean? There's a man in this town. The door was suddenly kicked wide and a blaze of bullets flew across the room. Kesley's mouth opened in shock, his knees buckled, and he pitched forward, bouncing off the desk to the floor. A tall, silver-haired gentleman was behind the gun. I caught him shoulder high, spun him around. The gun fell out of his hand, and Welsh and I were on him in a second. All right, all right. I've done all I'm going to do. I'm hurt. I'm wounded. Well, Your Honor, you're better off than Kesley. Uh, Kesley didn't want to do it. But I had something on his brother and told him I'd, I'd send him to jail. 
We saved a hundred thousand dollars on the cheap supplies we used in that building. Yeah, when I showed up, Chesley was afraid he was going to take a rap alone. He was afraid he'd end up like Albert Mitchell, right? Yes, yes, I, I killed Mitchell. He, he wanted more money. You killed him, you. Kitty, it. Kitty, don't put it down. Oh. Oh. She had come in while we were talking and picked up the gun Mayor Sullivan had dropped. Her one shot hit him in the chest. Then she let the gun slip through her fingers and just stood there. Then you know what? (laughs) She cried. Real tears. Period. End of report. Sam, what an awful tragedy. It was indeed, F. Of course, in a few minutes, the place was full of police and we turned her over. What do you think is going to happen to her, Sam? I'd rather not think about that, Effie. Now, how about typing it up? Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun this Sunday with two of your favorite families, the Blandings and the Harrises. Mr. and Mrs. Blanding stars Cary Grant and Betsy Drake in the title roles as the owners of the famous Dream House. And the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show brings you Phil and Alice with more of their merry antics, plus Frankie Remley, Brother William, and the entire cast. You're invited this Sunday. <laughs> Well, I'll take your word for it. I'm not going to read it again. Why did the mayor come in and shoot the building contractor in front of witnesses? Why, he threw away everything you worked so hard to steal. Why? That is a good question. If I... Oh, save by the knock. Come in. This is Sam Spade's office. It is? I'm Lyle Rooks. You expect me to believe that? I'm Western editor of Radio Television Mirror Magazine. Well, you know best... I just wanted to tell you that in our annual awards poll, nationwide, the American listeners have chosen Steve Dunn as their favorite detective. Steve Dunn? Not me? Be quiet, Sam. What? So here, sir, is your citation. You may want to frame it. Put it up in your office. Why? Thank you. Goodbye. Well, Steve Dunn, who is... He's the man to place you on the radio, Sam. Uh, oh, he's handsome. Well, do you love him better than you love me when I'm burning up with passion for you? Are you really burning up, Sam? Well, I'm beginning to smolder a little. Come here and tell me about love. Oh, well, I don't know much about it, Sam. Not as much as I'd like to know. Well, I'm sorry. Sorry, I don't have a teacher's permit for the state of California. (laughs) Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. (laughs) 